to the solar. All right, let's uh, uh, get started and uh, let's see. Okay, okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for a very exciting uh, event uh, with AIWA Los Angeles as biggest section. Uh, today, um, we have uh, distinguished speakers and very exciting uh, topic. Uh, the first uh, keynote speaker will tell us a very exciting story. But uh, before that, uh, we have some logistics to go over through. But first of all, we apologize to our second speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Stapp. Uh, he apologized he could not get the uh, material clear uh, by Jeff Bezos and uh, Blue Origin uh, in time. Uh, but he, he, will, he, he will be happy to share with us uh, later, uh, later on, a little bit later, uh, when Jeff Bezos Blue Origin, they are more ready to, to release the excitement uh, with us. Uh, so what happened is we all, uh, with, uh, you know, we discussed with the keynote speaker, Dr. Garrett. Uh, so we will extend the Q&A session and uh, if the second, uh, the third speaker, uh, Leia, she uh, can start a little bit early, like five, 10 minutes, that's uh, to ex uh, uh, extend her uh, briefing, that will be fine. If not, we'll uh, have more to discuss on this exciting topic of the uh, uh, space weather and uh, uh, SpaceX Starlink satellite launch anomaly. It's actually a full lecture. So uh, it's uh, actually, it's, it's good time to, uh, 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 learn more and discuss. Okay, so uh, at 12.05, 12 12.10, 12 uh, Mr. Peter Humphreys, we're talking about his uh, uh, exciting company and uh, proposal. And then Dennis is going to talk about a very exciting AR, VR stuff. And then we have Joe uh, from Mason Systems, Mason Space Systems. As you know, they have been doing wonderful uh, things uh, for going back to the moon, Artemis. Uh, so this, uh, uh, we have very exciting program today. Uh, so first of all, we uh, thanks a lot to AIW headquarters for providing us uh, this exciting Zoom platform. Uh, thanks a lot to the speakers and we will record a session and post it uh, online afterwards. And uh, just a few words, if you have any question, please type in the uh, Q&A box, but um, toward the Q&A session at the end of presentation, uh, we will enable your mic. Uh, please raise your hand and uh, uh, interact with the speaker. That's uh, uh, make it more fun because online you cannot really, you know, in person talk to the speaker or, or attendee. So we rely on this uh, Q&A session for the networking. So please do that whenever possible uh, for the privacy. Uh, security. Uh, Zoom is actually a balanced, very nice uh, platform, although it's not the top of security, but uh, it has improved a lot. If you are concerned about any security issue, uh, please don't talk talk anything about uh, what you do in your company if a company don't allow you to say uh, so uh, or personal information. So just a few words about AWA. Uh, is, AWA is a very special, unique organization. It came from a merger of in 1962-63 from two distinguished organizations formed both in the 1920s, one by the Wright brothers uh, on aviation, the other founded by Robert Goddard on rocketry. And these two organizations merged into AIAA in 1962-63. Uh, so not only AIAA has the history, but also have the people uh, like our distinguished uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Henry Garrett, uh, is our uh, double fellow and uh, many other people. So right, uh, right now, uh, our president is Mr. Basil Hassan, uh, Executive Director Daniel Dunbarker. He he's actually, he was a, a former NASA manager or uh, like uh, executives for the uh, DCX, DCXA program. Uh, so uh, there's some article talking about NASA actually uh, beating SpaceX and Blue Origin by 20 years for the vertical launch landing. And our section chair is Dr. Jeffrey Puschel, uh, is uh, uh, with Raytheon. Uh, so AIWA is a nonprofit professional organization with uh, strong uh, national and international uh, presence. So joining professional organization give you a lot of benefits, uh, networking, and you meet people you never be able to meet elsewhere. Uh, that's uh, networking. It's uh, good for your career as well, and. Uh, so 
Airtable is also membership based. So you, you can welcome to join. If you are not yet a member, you got a lot of benefits. Student high school membership is free. Uh, educator membership is free. Uh, young professional is actually early career professional is actually a professional member, but just early career. And uh, in, you enjoy 50% off and uh, under 35 years old uh, above college. So these are some of our volunteers officers. You can see Sherry from JPL, uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, section chair from Raytheon, Kirsty from Boeing, uh, Jennifer doing uh, aerospace laws and RP as the award-winning uh, educator, went to White House, uh, honored and uh, has uh, published books. Uh, and many, many Louise, Robert, Lynn, you know, just everybody amazing. And thanks a lot for their time and effort. Uh, so AWA, one thing very important is AWA has technical committees. Uh, that's the meat of AWA. And also AWA has the AWA Engage. It's like social media, but not exactly the same. It's like a bulletin board. Uh, you can contact members without knowing their email address and posting your information. A daily launch and Aerospace America, wonderful magazine. And uh, you enjoy this great discount for uh, uh, attending national uh, uh, conferences. And the AI that we publish, uh, like ARC, we have book awards. Uh, we encourage people to engage in professional uh, activity. For example, uh, Dr. Henry Garrett has books published. It's amazing books. I have a copy. It's just amazing. And uh, I, I, I'm studying it. It's just uh, uh, very, very lots of stuff. And the uh, have foundation, have uh, funding and industry guides. Career Center. And uh, one very important feature for LRA membership, uh, membership based uh, organization is uh, membership upgrades or advancement. For example, uh, our doctor, uh, speaker, Dr. Henry Garrett is a LRA fellow. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, some people you know, like the president of Aerospace Corporation, Mr. Steve Izakowicz is also a LRA fellow. An honorary fellow like Ms. Green Shotwell, Dr. Bill Gerstenmeyer, uh, and uh, this is uh, encourage people to do a very good job in your post. And uh, awards, you do a good job, not necessarily in technical thing, uh, papers, uh, technical contribution, education services. Uh, if you are still membership, you, you are eligible to apply uh, for AWA scholarship. And uh, these are the four, used to be five flagship uh, national forums. Now it's four, condensed into four. Uh, it's very exciting. And the local chapter of AWA has so many exciting people and the companies. Uh, don't blame it all, it's just uh, so many of them. JPL, uh, James Webb, you know, Northrop Grumman. Uh, it's just fantastic. SpaceX, of course, uh, and the many new and uh, existing companies. And uh, we keep doing events, you know, to keep people networking together and see what's going on and uh, uh, keep everybody happy and uh, engaged. Uh, aerospace. And uh, we also have monthly newsletter. For example, last month we featured uh, the late uh, professor uh, Eugene Parker, who's uh, an instrumental for the heliophysics and uh, uh, also the, 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 it was the name for the Parker Solar Pro. And uh, if you have an article, welcome to participate and submit. Uh, so Dr. our first speaker is our keynote speaker is Dr. Henry Garrett. He's uh, um, working with uh, JPL. It's an AWA fellow, and he just won the AWA Van Allen Award uh, this year, 2022. It's very honorable and uh, distinguished. As a doctor degree in uh, space basic astronomy, he has over 150 publications on space environment and effects uh, with sp uh, specific emphasis in the areas of atmospheric uh, physics and low Earth ionosphere radiation, micrometeoroids, space plasma environments, and the effects on materials and the system in space. While on active duty in the Air Force, he served as project scientist for the highly successful SCATA program, which studied the effects of charging in sp on spacecraft. Uh, for this, he was awarded the Harold, Harold Brown Award, the Air Force's highest scientific award. In 1992, he was selected for a joint DOD NASA assignment at the Pentagon as part of the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization, where he acted as the deputy program manager for the Clementine Lunar Mission and the program manager for the Clementine Interstage Adapter Satellite, ISIS. For contribution to these missions, he was awarded NASA's medal 
for exceptional engineering achievement. After a 30 years career in US Air Force Reserves, he retired in 2002 as a full colonel and was awarded the Air Force Legion of Merit. During his 40 years career at JPL, he has been responsible for defining the space environment uh, and its effects on reliability for many NASA missions. He has also published several textbooks on the space environment and its impact on spacecraft design and the reliability. Dr. Garrett is an international, international consultant on the terrestrial and the interplanetary space environments and the spacecraft reli reliability, having worked for Intelsat, the uh, Guardi, NASA, Laurel, CNES, and uh, other organizations. In 2006, Dr. Garrett received NASA's Exceptional Service Medal for his achievements in advancing the understanding of space environments and effects. Uh, recently, Dr. Garrett co-authored with Mr. Albert Whittlesey, uh, the primary NASA standard on spacecraft surface and the internal charging for Earth's mission. Dr. Garrett retired from full-time duty, duty at JPL in 2017, but continues in an emeritus position. He was made a fellow of AIW in 2019, of, of course, uh, I just mentioned Ben Allen Awards uh, just this year. So that's, uh, uh, without further ado, let's heartily welcome Dr. Henry Garrett. Thank you, Ken. Let's see if I can share my screen, okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, share screen. There we go. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Uh, well, clearly my name is Henry Garrett and I'm uh, uh, currently uh, still attached to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory part-time as an emeritus uh, employee. Uh, my main levels in areas of interest are, as was pointed out, the space environment and its effect on spacecraft systems. I've been primarily used at JPL to define the radiation and plasma environments from everywhere from the Earth to Jupiter and to the outer planets and the solar wind and their effects on things like the solar sails and the solar probe mission and other advanced uh, study efforts that we do at JPL. In my talk today, I'd like to go over some of those environments with particular emphasis on the uh, effects on the Earth's atmosphere and its effects on the recent Starlink uh, SpaceX uh, launch anomalies that they had in orbit. So let's go on. Uh, as serve as background, uh, the bottom line is that as we launch more and more spacecraft, uh, particularly the CubeSats into orbit, which are not uh, given as much reliability engineering design as most spacecraft, they become they're very sensitive to the uh, ambient effects of the space environment. For example, as we'll see the atmospheric drag effects. The problem is that as you go from a class, what we call a class A mission, like a Galileo or like a Cassini mission, or like the upcoming Europa mission, where you put every effort into looking at the effects of the space environment, you test all the systems. For example, we expose all the wires to the uh, ambient uh, Jovian radiation environment to see if they'll discharge due to buildup and charge in the wires extreme links that we go to to make sure that reliability engineering is carried out on those missions. Unfortunately, at the other end, you have the university developed and private individual developed CubeSats. Now, the CubeSats, as you know, are as cheap as you can make them. As a result of that, there's typically very little uh, reliability engineering put into them. And they're basically designed to go up, last for a few weeks or months, and then die and hopefully decay back into the atmosphere. But somewhere in between there lies a fertile ground for defining the environment and its effects on your systems so that you can build instruments, you can build your spacecraft to last uh, over the desired mission train. As you know, JPL typically designs missions like Voyager that's now in its 40th year of running. There are two of them out there in, the, in interstellar space. Uh, we have even the little uh, helicopter that we designed for Mars, which was supposed to last for five flights, is now in its 20th, going into its 21st mission. So basically, JPL builds ultra-reliable equipment. Unfortunately, 
Uh, that's not uh, uh, possible for many people uh, because of cost, schedule, or launch opportunities and things of that nature. So in our talk today, we're going to go through uh, some of just some of the issues that we have with the space environment, particularly as associated with satellite drag. But I'd like to give you my moral. An ounce of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. I don't know if you know the humor behind that, but JPL and its contractor got feet and meters mixed up on one of the Mars missions and we plunked one right into Mars. Um, up to the end, they were arguing over who was using feet and who were using meters. So just remember that an ounce of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. <clears throat> so here's what we're gonna cover today. I'd like to go through and give you an overview of, of some of the forms of solar activity <clears throat> and go through the effects that they have on our spacecraft missions. I'd then like to give you a brief overview of how the solar environment affects the Earth's magnetosphere and atmosphere, as this is critical to how the atmosphere responds to the solar activity and how that led to the effects of the space X Starlink spacecraft. So how does the atmosphere respond? Well, we'll see that the, the sun through various mechanisms ranging from extreme ultraviolet heating to particles precipitation to electric fields uh, imposed on the Earth's polar caps uh, to heating the atmosphere and making it uh, basically explode upwards and lead to increased drag. So what are the effects on, of the atmosphere on spacecraft? I will just briefly mention and I want to point out now that it turns out that drag is not the only effect on spacecraft. Some of the other issues that we'll discuss briefly are atomic oxygen erosion and spacecraft glow. I'll give you a couple examples of that real quickly. And then I'll <clears throat> go into how you quantify drag on a spacecraft. I have a couple of charts that allow you to uh, figure out uh, what the drag on your spacecraft might be. <clears throat> and finally, we'll go into the specific issue of what happened to the Starlink satellites. So here we go. Um, here's some of the main types of forms of solar activity. I think the one we're most uh, well aware of is so-called sunspots. Uh, these are basically uh, the intense magnetic field alignments in the sun's atmosphere that leads to what look like dark spots. Actually, they're very bright, but against the even brighter solar disk, they look to be dark, where the plasma is trapped along magnetic field lines. As if you look down at the bottom uh, under, under prominences, you can see what we're talking about. Sunspots always typically occur in pairs and because the yeah, magnetic field has to go in and it has to come out uh, through because it's a current loop formed by a current loop. So sunspots is one major activity. Uh, another one is coronal holes. Typically, if a prominence or coronal mass ejection that we show here <coughs> expands outward from the sun, uh, the gases expand out at high, high velocities. Typically, the magnetic fields of the sun and keep the plasma near the sun, but every so often they'll blow open, like this prominence down here or the coronal mass ejection you see will blow open and the solar wind will spill out at very high velocities. Typical solar wind velocities are three to 400 kilometers per second. A coronal hole, for example, can be up to thousands of kilometers per second, as can be a coronal mass ejection. I was privileged to work with Joan Feynman where we measured uh, uh, Richard Feynman's sister, who uh, measured the highest velocity at the time, 2,500 kilometers per second. And I think since then, we've seen upwards of 3,000 kilometers per second coming out of coronal mass ejections and coronal holes. <coughs> now, seen on <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we have a sip of some water here. <coughs> as seen <coughs> as a sunspot moves to the side of the sun, you can notice, you can see down here, I don't, know if you can, I don't know if you can see my marker, but you can see the loop formed here. This would be a sunspot, this would be a sunspot, and this would be the magnetic field lines going like this. You can see the outline of the magnetic field lines. And this is the plasma on those field lines. And every so often there's enough plasma in here that the uh, pressure, the, the plasma energetic energy is sufficient to overcome the magnetic field strength of the solar 
field. And this region then will blow out and you'll get the, and go like this and you'll get the things like coronal mass ejections or solar flares as we'll see in a second. This is the sun down here. This is a, a shadow disk. So you, because they, they can't get in too close with this instrument. But this is <clears throat> what the uh, large coronal mass ejections look like. Coronal mass ejection is when uh, you get a merging of uh, major so, uh, prominences and, uh, and sunspots on the sun, and they lead to a huge injection across, as you can see here, a large angular distance of the sun. And you're looking, and you can see that it blows out. We'll see a picture of that in just a second, showing you the uh, plasma going out from the sun. Now, I want to make a distinction. In the past, we've always thought of solar flares. Well, in recent years, we've come to the conclusion that there are two different types of phenomena. Solar flares are localized mergings of the magnetic field and resulting uh, uh, ejection of plasma into space. Coronal mass ejections occur over much larger longitudinal regions and you can in time, and you can see one here. Flares are typically very short, just a couple of days, or a day or less, whereas a coronal mass ejection can take up to several days. So there's two types of events. The, the there's the gradual events, of CME-driven shock accelerated waves that come out. There are a few, about 10 per year, whereas there are about a thousand of these solar flares per year. And the thing to remember is the distinction. Solar flares are typically smaller, very short-lived, and make a sharp peak in x-rays. Coronal mass ejections are large ejections of plasma over a large region of the sun, as we'll see. <clears throat> and as a result of that, that big cloud goes out, and it compresses the plasma in front of it and causes that plasma to be accelerated. And you get these, these very intense proton events as coming away from the coronal mass ejection. So let's start, let's look at some. This is what we mean by solar flares and, and coronal mass ejections. In the old days, we thought there would be a solar flare, uh, a coronal, uh, where sunspots merge and you'd see the magnetic, these are the particles spiraling out along the magnetic field lines. This is only flares. The new pictures that we have, the same type of thing, you'll get a few local mergings on some spots and stuff, and you'll get particles coming out along the lines. But instead of that, we get these large longitudinal regions being ejected from the sun, and they cause a shock wave that hits the uh, plasma in front of it in the solar wind and accelerates the protons to very high energies. And these are when we get the really intense solar proton events. Now watch closely. There it goes. You see that little ring? That's a plasma ring coming out from the sun, from the shock wave. You can see the coronal mass ejections and the little individual little solar flares going off. And these are seen right there. I'm going to let it cycle through again because I want you to see. <laughs> I think it's fascinating that you can shoot smoke rings off the sun, uh, plasma rings, because of the way the currents uh, have to have a closed current system. And we're coming up on it in just a second here. And notice all this, the coronal mass, here it goes, here we go. There we go, see that? You can see in the background, you can see the stars and every so often you can see one of the planets come around. And I don't know if you can notice it, but every so often you'll see little streaks in here. Those are uh, cosmic rays from the sun, solar protons and stuff. There you go, you see one down there causing in <coughs> interference in the pixels in the camera. So this is what they look like. Let's start up at the top. <clears throat> you can see the prominence. You can see it start to, to blow out. You can see it break open. See it break, as you can see as it proceeds, it breaks open, comes out, and you get this massive uh, emission of plasma. And like they say, about 10 of these or less a year. And about once every 20 years, we get a really big one that hits the earth. And uh, back in the 1800s, we had one that uh, in the early days of telegraphy, that the uh, electric fields that it produced were so intense on the ground that it actually melted the uh, uh, telegraph keys as they were trying to, trying to type them, type with them. And the effects of these coronal mass ejections can be very severe. And uh, we worry about them actually uh, causing power outages like in Quebec uh, back in 1989, 
the, the storm we'll be talking about, the March storm of 1989, uh, shorted out the uh, tr big transformers outside of Quebec. And as a result of that, they were out of power for two or three days. And uh, we're really worried about that. We've had a couple since then that could have caused major damage on the earth, but fortunately one of them, the really biggest one went the other way. So coronal mass ejections are the big hurricanes in space. Now, so they are superimposed on this. The red is magnetic field lines going into the sun. Magnetic blue is going out in this particular case. And what we're seeing here is a coronal mass ejection going out from the sun and producing the shock waves that, that you can see out in, you can see along in here and such as they go out. So what you're doing, you're looking down on the sun and what, what's happening is that's the normal background field. The magnetic field goes out and comes back in. You have to have just as much magnetic field going out as coming in. And then every so often you get one of these coronal mass ejections. And as it happens, you can see the magnetic field gets smushed up against the one in front of it. And it's these regions in here where uh, the particles are reflected back and forth and the protons, for example, get accelerated up to tens, to, 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 to upwards of 100 MeV particles can be accelerated in these sh shock waves that are formed by the coronal mass ejection as it goes out from the sun. But again, I wanna stress that the uh, normal, normal state of the, of the solar wind is a nice quiet, uh, to, sort of one or two, uh, two sets of streams like is seen here. <clears throat> now, let's see what happens. What we're most interested in, of course, is the Earth's magnetic field uh, and how it interacts with the solar wind. The solar wind has typically got densities of about a few tens of particles per cubic centimeter. It typically has a few electron volts of energy, electron volts about 10,000 degrees. Uh, so, you, so it's, it's energetic, but it's not that energetic compared to what uh, we worry about in space, which are up to 20 kilo, kilo electron volts for spacecraft charging, 100 ke, kilo electron volts or higher for radiation damage from protons, electrons, and uh, heavy ions. But this is what the Earth's magnetic field looks like in a, in a sort of a, a average shape. If you come over here, the solar wind comes this way and the, the, that plasma, the few particles per cubic centimeter uh, coming out at about 400, 500 kilometers per second causes the balances with the magnetic field of the earth and its plasmas at about 10 to 20 uh, earth radiuses outwards from the sun. I mean, so, sorry, from the earth out here. This is called the sh uh, shock bound, bow shock boundary and the plasma pause and such of these regions in here. The main regions that we're interested in today is over the polar caps. Notice that the magnetic field lines drape backwards uh, from away from that. This is the dipole type magnetic field you're used to. You can see that here. These are magnetic field lines that make the dipole. But when the solar wind comes by with its plasma, it tears these off and drags them back into the tail. It makes a tail that goes out well up towards uh, several hundred Earth radiuses, maybe even a thousand Earth radiuses downwind. In fact, the magnetic tail for Jupiter extends all the way out to Saturn. And the, so you can see the solar wind drags this region out, just like in, in a, a ship in the, in the water, it drags it out. But the bottom line is it creates this cleft region up here. And it turns out that high energy protons and ions can come in when they're coming from the sun, come down and heat up the polar cap in here. By and large, the electrons, however, typically go back and come up the tail of the earth and, the and come in into the auroral zone back over here near midnight. And we'll show you some pictures of that in just a minute. So the bottom line is that you have a teardrop shaped magnetic field for the earth. That teardrop is dragged back into, into a planetary space with the solar wind flowing along it. And then every so often you'll get one of these coronal mass ejections that'll come along and compress the earth's magnetic field and cause it to have in plasma instabilities, for example, back in here. It, it causes the magnetic tail to be compressed and as it compresses, the magnetic field lines along here can convert, can 
uh, merge, do what we call merge and snap in and cause the aurora. We'll see that on the right over here. This is the normal average uh, magnetic field configuration on March the 31st, 1989. Here comes the first of the coronal mass ejections. That gray stuff is, is, is an artifact of the simulation. But look what happens. The magnetic field of the Earth is smudged, is crushed inwards. Now we'll see another, see another wave come by in just a second. There you go. Gets, goes back to, starts to go back to normal. And then, then another wave comes from the coronal mass ejection. That's the intense, sol again, the intense solar wind coming back and uh, basically flattening the um, magnetic field of the earth. Here it goes again, watch, you can see it, the same thing, see it just repeating. And you can see how it crosses. and you can see this, if you look carefully, you can see it snap. Part, part of it goes this way and part of it goes this way following the, the, the compression. Let's see if we can catch that again. Let's see, come on, Where, there we go. Okay, here we go. It's coming up. And again, this is a simulation. There it goes. See it crush. And then all of a sudden you see the plasma shoot down the tail and you see it spring back this way. That accelerates the electrons to tens of keV in energy, this, the low energy solar wind electrons. And so they spring back in. They're going to generate the aurora, as we'll see in the next couple of slides. But here's what's interesting. This, is, this would be the geosynchronous orbit for the GOES 6 and 7 satellites on, on March the the, in March 1989. Now what happens is the solar wind comes in. It's going, this, is, this is measurements at the satellites of the magnetic field. And you can see what happens that the magnetic field at, at both satellites is pointing northwards, and, which is normal for the Earth's magnetic field at those distances. And all of a sudden it goes southwards intensely southwards. That's because the field is, the solar wind is pushed in and you're actually seeing the solar wind boundary come into here, inside geosynchronous orbit, I'm sorry. And that's what you see the dropouts. And you can see there are at least two ways on both satellites. You can see into the, in the Earth's magnetic field, in the solar wind, in the Earth's magnetic field, in the solar wind. And you can see that in the, you can see that in the movie over here. Now, Let's look what happens. Now, as I pointed out to you, the heavy ions and, and uh, protons tend to come in over the polar caps into that so-called cleft region that, uh, towards the sun where there's no magnetic field. It's basically a, a, a funnel that they can come in. But around them is the region called the auroral zone. And this is actually the magnetic field lines that go out into the tail. And as, they're, as the tail is compressed, there's an instability and the plasma comes in from that direction. And here you can see, the, this is the statistics for the ultra bright aurora. It's only like a quarter of a percent of the time are you gonna get really intense aurora. But when that happens and the satellite go, is in a polar orbit and it goes through the aurora, it can charge up to 20 kilovolts. And there's, there's, what, there's some arguments that somebody claims they saw upwards of 80 kilovolts potential on the spacecraft. The electrons basically can come in in a region like, in this region like here, this is midnight over here, this is the sun over here, and the plasma is coming in this way and it floods in over the polar caps, comes down into the aurora, which I, which I will show some pictures of later. And this is lighting up the atmosphere, by the way. It's like a cathode, the earth acts like a cathode ray tube with the auroral particles coming in. And down and around in here, and this, this, this region is projected over here. This is from uh, long-term statistics uh, where they measured the, in the intensity of the aurora. And you can see that it occurs around 70, uh, 70, 75 degrees magnetic latitude. Remember the Earth's magnetic field is offset by 11 degrees from the uh, uh, spin axis of the Earth. And it's in Hudson's Bay right now is where the magnetic field is, though it's starting to move away. Uh, and this is local midnight. So you can see that the most intense aurora as a function of local time occur right near midnight on the earth. This is the probability distribution of them over here. Now I wanna note that there's a, uh, the, the, uh, air, uh, the uh, Space Environments uh, Weather Service 
provides extensive measurements of these in real time and does predictions and, uh, and keeps records on all the auroral and geomagnetic activity. And you can go to the uh, uh, World Data Center in Boulder, for example, and get that access to that data immediately in real time. And they will actually send you out warnings of when they think they're going to be aurora. So if you're going up to Alaska on a trip, you might want to check the uh, bulletins that they issue every day for uh, what the likelihood of an aurora is, so you when to go out and look. But typically at midnight, you're going to see a really intense aurora up around uh, 60 to 70 degrees geographic. It's, you can see it's up in, up in here. And sometimes, like in 1972 and 1989, the aurora can push very far south. In 1972, the storm was so intense that they saw the aurora borealis over Mexico City. I want you to repeat that. They saw the aurora borealis over Mexico City down over here. So uh, you can see that it can be very intense. And we find that the uh, spacecraft charging at midnight can cause severe damage to our spacecraft. Uh, the SCATHA mission that you heard mentioned in my uh, resume uh, was the only satellite specifically designed to study spacecraft charging. And the purpose was for the military and commercial people to figure out how to prevent the effects of this charging. Now, let's look at the next effect of the, uh, of the coronal mass ejections or the solar, or solar flares and, solar and other activity in the solar wind. Basically what happens is the particles come down over the polar cap, they heat the atmosphere there, the sun uh, will set out X-ray uh, flares and heat the atmosphere that way from the e extreme ultraviolet. And yeah, that, that, of course, shines on the whole hemisphere of the Earth. The uh, particles come down over the polar caps. The aurora come down at lower latitudes. And the bottom line is that when the aurora hit the atmosphere, they both, they both uh, cause heating. And, but they also, gener they also generate electric. There's an electric field generated by the solar wind from uh, dawn to dusk. And that electric field drives a current in, over the polar caps. And, also, and also has some effects at the equator. But the bottom line is, is this is a surface current that it drives uh, like uh, along in, uh, around in longitude as opposed to the aurora, which are coming down along the field lines. And the long this longitudinal electric field causes heating of the atmosphere also. And in a space of minutes, you can get over an order of magnitude enhancement in the atmosphere of the earth uh, because of the heating and increase in temperature. Now, I'd like to explain to you the physics of why that happens. This is the first of a couple of physics uh, things I'd like to go into. Uh, let's start up here. I think we're all familiar with the PV equals NKT, pressure times the volume is equal to the number of particles times the constant times the temperature. All right, Boltzmann constant. And so this is temperature, the pressure, volume, number of particles. Okay, so let's take the number of particles and divide them by the volume. So that's the number density. So now we get that the pre pressure is equal to the number density times Boltzmann constant times temperature. And changing that over, we get that the number density is equal to the pressure over KT. It's a very simple formula. Now, the other simple formula that we have to deal with is, hydro is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Basically, what we want to look at is what is the if we assume the atmosphere is balanced, then what we can we can say is that a pressure, the change in pressure, is equal to the change in force vertically over the area. So pressure is force per unit area. So change in pressure is equal to the change in force over you, uh, per unit area. Okay, so what's force? Well, think of think of a little cube of air. And think of it, we're interested in the vertical dimension, dx over here. And so we take the mass of the, the mass of individual atmospheric particles times their number density, times g, that's acceleration of gravity, times their area, times their thickness. Area times thickness is volume. So volume times number density gives you the total number of particles times the, the mass of each particle. So this is, this is F. This is the force 
uh, the DF that you're getting uh, from, from top of the atmosphere to the bottom of the atmosphere, just simply the mass of a little cube of uh, air. And we're dividing by the air. All right, so now we got that. Then we can go back up here and we, you do, we can substitute for the uh, N and we get this formula. Okay, so let's solve that formula. We, change, we move the pressure over to here. We move the, uh, we, we, move, we go down here and we take the, get rid of the area. Okay, well, anyway, you can see what I'm doing. You take this, move the pressure over here and you have this formula here. And so now let's integrate from the pressure at the ground up to the pressure at some given height. And that's from the ground to a given height. And we integrate that and we get this formula. And you can easily show from this equation up here that you can get to N, the number density is equal to the number density at the ground, to, uh, also uh, to this exponential formula. And this is the whole trick right here. In other words, the pressure, the number density, they vary exponentially as, and drop off exponentially as you move up in height as a function of the temperature, the density of the particle, the mass of the given particle times gravity and times the height in which you're at. And so let's go over here. Now, this is an actual profile of the Earth's atmosphere. You can see up here that uh, nitrogen right here dominates in the lower atmosphere. It drops off very quickly. Um, as you can see here, and then you have oxygen. So it's about 78% uh, nitrogen, 18 to 19% oxygen, O2, and the rest of all uh, sorts of other gases. And you can see those down here. Now below 100 kilometers, turns out that there are enough atoms and molecules that they bang into each other and they thoroughly mix themselves. So this region down here is called, is called the homosphere, where uh, and this is called the heterosphere. The difference being that this is all mixed. All the atmospheric molecules and atoms are mixed together. And so it's a fixed percentage, nitrogen, oxygen, and then the other species. But at 100 kilometers, it turns out that the particles can no longer collide with each other. They can go a long distance before they hit another atom. Another atom. So then we basically differentiate into different species. And so starting at about 100 kilometers, it starts to go into O2. And then from, and eventually it'll actually go into O. But the bottom line is at some point it goes into hydrogen over here. And it's because hydrogen is the lightest and it goes up. But the thing I want you to notice is that all of these above this point are dependent on the temperature. So if the temperature goes up, the scale height goes up, and the atmosphere basically explodes. So if you have a profile here, it goes over to here. And you've got an infinite sink down here. Look at this. This is ten, four to ten, four orders of magnitude greater at this point than up here. And you can see it drops off dramatically from here. So this is basically an infinite sink. The atmosphere doesn't respond very much below 100 kilometers. But above 100 kilometers, it basically explodes as you change the temperature of the atmosphere. It literally explodes and the, uh, these, all these profiles go to the right and the drag increases dramatically. Now, let's look at some of the, uh, some of the other atmospheric effects. We're going to look at drag in detail here in a few more slides, but I'd like to just mention these uh, because I think you'll find that they're interesting. It turns out I, I met with Owen Gary at one time, I was talking with him about this. Turns out that as you go through the atmosphere at low altitudes, below 500 kilometers in particular, you can see the front surface of your spacecraft glowing in this orangish color down here, almost as bright as this. This is the tail of the shuttle as it's uh, ramming into the, into the uh, ox oxygen dominated atmosphere. What we think happens is the uh, O uh, rams into the surface of a satellite combines with N to form NO2, and th that comes off the surface excited state and drops down to this and gives off this orange glow. So that's called a spacecraft glow or atmosphere or shuttle glow phenomena. And it can be very bright. And if you have sensors that are looking in the direction you're moving, you may want to be careful to consider it. And we've gone to some length to measure it and try to figure out the details, but it's still somewhat 
not well defined. But the bottom line is that you, your satellite will glow below 500 kilometers in the direction you're moving. And it can be quite bright. Owen oh, Garriott told me he could read by the light when he was outside. On the right over here, we have what is probably the most serious effect after drag in the lower atmosphere. That's called oxygen erosion. These are some blankets from the uh, space shuttle. You can see this is before launch, this uh, formal Kapton, well, CMP thermal blanket, I think it's Kapton. And then on the right, you can see when they brought it back and looked at it, it's been scored, it's been eaten away and such. It turns out that the atomic oxygen, that the oxygen, atomic oxygen and O2 that are hitting you are moving at about seven kilometers per second. And as a result of that, you are getting, uh, you're getting energies up into the tens of EV, or since it's the one EV is 10,000 degrees, you're gonna just basically, you're flaming the surfaces and anything that's not metal or some, fo uh, some forms of mylar and such, uh, it can be eaten away in inst almost instantly. They brought back the LDEF uh, spacecraft that with long duration exposure facility and entire surfaces on the front were eaten away. There were little holes in some of the gold plating and the oxygen got underneath there and ate all the kapton underneath it out. Just and all you had was gold leaf left on the front surfaces of the vehicle. Backs, the back surface was pretty pristine clean except for all the contamination. It turned brown because of all the gunk that uh, outgassed from LDEF. But the front surface melt basically was, sand, was, was uh, fire blasted uh, to the extent that it uh, almost didn't exist. And so on the space station in particular, they're very careful to make sure what surfaces are out exposed. They're constantly flying new materials to see what the uh, oxygen uh, erosion effects can be on them. So now let's get to the meat of the talk today. The one thing that we're most concerned about is drag uh, at low altitudes. The basic equation is up on the right. Now, my first job in the Air Force was to calculate drag on very low altitude satellites. We're talking about 100 kilometers uh, and, and up. Uh, uh, below 100 kilometers, the lowest that a satellite has ever flown, uh, my old laboratory used to be called the Air Force Cambridge Research Labs, and it became the Air Force Geophysics Labs. Now it's called the uh, uh, Air Force Research Labs, but up in Hanscom Air Force Base. Uh, we were doing these types of calculations uh, for all the Air Force satellites at the time, and they wanted to see how low they could go, so they took a ball Made it, made it out of, in, of depleted uranium, shot it around at, managed to get one orbit at 90 kilometers. So 90 kilometers is basically the, the limit that you can complete one orbit without coming in because of drag. And that's for a depleted ball of uranium. Anyway, this is the, this is the basic equation. The drag force is equal to one half the density of the atmosphere times the velocity that you're traveling relative to it, times a constant, times your cross-sectional area. Now, of these, um, rho varies dramatically. As I was trying to say, the atmospheric density can go up one to two orders of magnitude in spaces of minutes. And think of it as big wave coming out of the auroral zone or a big heat, a blast of UV radiation hitting the atmosphere. And you literally get a wave and that's what makes it complicated because the response to the atmosphere is not totally straightforward. And you can get waves and troughs and things like that. But the bottom line is that the density goes up dramatically. And so this, so this can go, the drag force can go up dramatically in spaces of minutes. You, we saw the LDEF in the 1989 storm drop about five to 10 kilometers in the space of an hour. It just literally just tried to fall out of the space um, as a result of that. And I'll show you the results on a whole bunch of satellites from that storm in just a minute. The big, the other, the other issue, you can kind of figure out what your cross-sectional area is, but the other big problem is this thing called the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient is very difficult to determine primarily because it has to do with the accommodation of the particles hitting the surface and how they reflect off the surface, whether they get stuck, whether they reflect, whether they scatter off the surface. What the temperature of the surface does also has an effect 
on the drag coefficient. And it's different from material to material. So the problem is you really don't, you really haven't got a good idea of this unless you fly your satellite for a long time. And that's basically what they'll do. They'll calculate the orbit of a satellite, figure out the drag forces on it, and keep adjusting them till they get uh, till they get a drag coefficient that and cross-sectional area if they can get the orientation that match to give you the best uh, fit for the orbit. And as we'll see in a minute, what what the our, our friends at uh, SpaceX did is they changed the cross-sectional area dramatically to try to save their satellites. So here's some typical numbers. The cross sec the uh, drag coefficient, typically between 2.2 and 4 in space. Uh, the, for the space shuttle, which has the largest variations, we can see 50, uh, 50 square meters if you're going right in nose first, 400 square meters if you go in belly first. The typical uh, velo orbital velocity relative to it it was upwards of 7.6 kilometers per second. Remember, the atmosphere of the Earth is sticking pretty much to the Earth. You're orbiting at 7.6 kilometers per second relative to an atmosphere that takes 24 hours to go around. So the bottom line is that uh, orbital velocity pretty much what you're going to be hitting the, at hitting the atmosphere with at this altitude. And this is the density. If you go back to the charts I showed you, you'll see that that's up. And so this shows you how much the drag can, can change just for the space shuttle, uh, depending on how they oriented it. So it's tremendous. Now, here's a key chart for you. And I'd like you to keep this one in mind. Um, I didn't run it down to 200, unfortunately, but 200 is right over here goes about like this. But what you're looking at is this is the years that you will stay in orbit for this measurement of solar activity called F10.7. The F10.7 index is a proxy for solar extreme ultraviolet. In other words, the sunlight uh, changes slightly in the EUV and makes large changes in the density of the atmosphere as a result. Now, what we found in the early days is we couldn't measure the EUV directly because of the because we can only measure it from the ground. We didn't have enough EUV satellite, didn't have EUV satellites and stuff up there. So we looked at a number of different pro, so-called proxies. And one of the ones we looked at was the radio output of the sun. And we found that the 10.7 centimeter radio line from the sun correlated very well with what we thought was the atmospheric density changes due to EUV heating in the atmosphere. So F10.7 continues to this day as a useful index. They measure the radio wave output from the sun, and they give you that number. And it's typically down over here in the 50 to 75 range, um, to 100 range. But every so often, as you'll see for the uh, uh, SpaceX satellites and stuff, it can, they can jump up within the space of a few hours. And as a result, heat up the atmosphere. Now. This is the amount of time you'll stay in orbit. So for example, if you're, at, if you're at 400 kilometers, you'll stay in orbit for, let's see, one, two, three. You'll stay in orbit typically at 400 kilometers, initial orbit, you'll stay in orbit for four years uh, for, a seven, for a normal background solar radiation. If it goes up to say 200, you're gonna be in orbit for about a year or less if you're at 400 kilometers. So, and this is for a normal uh, few square meters satellite. The Explorer series, you can look it up. They're a standard size satellite uh, for the time. And this gives you an idea of how long you'll stay in orbit. For, look, for example, in, in contrast, at 800 kilometers, you will, even at the most high activity, it'll take over 100 years or more for you to come down low enough so your orbit will decay. So, that's basically, this chart gives you a quick and dirty uh, reference for figuring out for your mission how long you'll stay up. You can get forecast of F10.7 or you can get the, the, the recent history of this index. And uh, from that, you can, you can check F10.7. They have forecast what it'll do over a solar cycle, things like that. So this is one of the ways that you can forecast how long you'll stay in orbit from orbital decay. Now, here's the biggie. This was in that storm in March 1989 that I keep referring to. The March 1989 storm 
uh, the coronal mass ejection hit the Earth. Uh, surprisingly, it did. The solar protons did not come with it, and uh, the turns out that the uh, later in the year there was a September October time frame there was a much more severe solar proton event from the same region on the sun, but it didn't have any. It was not associated with the, the dense plasma from the coronal mass ejection. So remember, from a coronal mass ejection, you get two effects. Almost immediately, the high energy particles, and then the, the slower back up, you'll get the uh, uh, plasma later on, a few days later. And this, this is the geomagnetic activity index. In this case, it was the so-called AP index, which is a daily index of the uh, disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. You can see it peaked here. This is a very high number. It's typically down over here around two to 300 during a da daily average. And this is, it peaked and it dropped off with, a, this is the timeline, it dropped off in a couple of days. This is the number of satellites that they could, that they had bad orbits for. They typically track up to tens of thousands, uh, 10,000 or more satellites. And the, of those, maybe a few hundred to a thousand are the, the orbits are poorly defined, typically because of drag and uh, not knowing exactly the cross section of the satellite and how it is affected by atmospheric drag, but typically the low altitude satellites. So typically, this is the number you'd get. All of a sudden, notice how it shoots up. It went up a factor of seven in the, a day or so following the heating of the atmosphere by this geomagnetic storm. And it took them then about, uh, as you can see, about 10 days before they were able to, then the atmosphere quieted down, before they were able to re identify each of these satellites, figure out where it was, and recompute the orbit based on quiet atmospheric drag conditions. So this is what happens when the storm hits. Storm hits, you lose track of, of upwards of 1,400 satellites in a space of a few hours. And then it takes you about 10 days or so to figure out uh, where all of them are. And that's the biggest effect and the biggest issue with the tra uh, tracking satellites and uh, trying to figure out what's up there. NORAD is, the old NORAD was very concerned with these kinds of issues. Now let's look at the space link, SpaceX Starlink problem in particular. Okay, you're starting with about a 200, 60 kilogram, about 60 pound, 600 pound satellite, about the size it says here, a coffee table. There are about 30,000 of them will go into orbit. I think there have been 2,000 to 3,000 have orbited as of today. And so they're really, they're throwing them up as fast as they can. I hate to say it, they may be putting up there before they get asked not to put them up there, given all the space debris problems that they're going to produce over the long term. Uh, the problem was, that they launched a, a batch of about 49 satellites in February 3rd into a 209 kilometer uh, perigee parking orbit. Now, the reason they put them at these low altitudes, they obviously are gonna they move them upwards to their final orbit so they'll last for a lot longer um, um, after they check each one of them out. The thing is, if it's dead or something, leaving it at 209 kilometers, it'll decay within, a, as you saw from the previous charts, within a few, uh, few months, days or months. And so that's, they park them there, check them out. If they, uh, ha if they haven't uh, been working, then they move them to a higher, if they have been working, they move them to a higher orbit and the, the others they let just fall back in the atmosphere. It's a good strategy. Uh, so far, 40 have re-entered uh, of the 49 that they launched. Uh, what, they what we believe happens was that there was an observed coronal mass ejection, which I keep harping on, occurred on 29 January and reached the Earth on around 2, 3 February. It was associated with a CME, uh, associated with CME was a G1 class solar geomagnetic storm at the Earth. And this, in, this, this geomagnetic storm ejected plasma from the tail and you had heating over the polar caps, all that, all that stuff happened. And that increased the drag, they say here, by 50% uh, for just from that storm. So what did they do? Well, they immediately started repositioning their satellites. This is what they look like as best I can understand from their, their literature. This is a satellite and this is the solar array. And the solar array, of course, is the big drag. And so 
the uh, so what they tried to do is turn it sideways as quick as they could. They apparently got nine of them turned sideways before the uh, drag took them down. But you can imagine what happened. You turn this you turn this edge on, and so the drag goes down substantially, and that worked for nine of them that they got. So that's the problem. And this is their orbit. By the way, they go up into the aurorals. You can see they go up very high. It looks like, uh, I guess that's uh, Greenland. And so they're up near the auroral zone. Now, let's look at the space conditions to start with. I'm going to brag. This is my picture I took of the storm. <laughs> I didn't know that, the, that their satellites were going to crash down, but I got a nice picture of it. You can see one of the, the solar prominence over here. This is probably the region's region right here. This is a couple of days later. This is the coron coronal hole over here. You can see it right here. This is probably where the, the burst of uh, solar wind was coming out. It was probably th this type of thing that blew open. I th this may be this region right here. I'm not sure. And I think this is this region over here. And I think this is this region right here. But anyway, this is a picture I took from my backyard. I'm, and uh, I took it on the... Uh, Let's see where I, I took it on the left. I took it in H alpha, on, that's the hydrogen line, um, on February the 5th. And that's when supposedly everything uh, hit. These, are, these where the minor storms are. Apparently this is the launch. This is, this is the period in which the uh, uh, solar storm hit the earth. And then you can see what it looked like a few days later to give you some idea. And this is the one of the aurora associated with that solar storm. So indeed there was a solar storm at, at the sun. There's a there, there, and this is the uh, aurora at the earth. And so the CME apparently hit the earth uh, at February, 24 hours later, the aurora started acting up and you can see the results of all this. So at least gives you some feel for what, uh, what we know from the, the background activity. KP is the other major act index. KP is a one-to-one -one relatable to AP. Uh, KP is a three-hour index based on magnetic magnetometer readings all around the earth at mid-latitudes. Basically, they take a measurement of the magnetic field of the earth every three hours and they send from about uh, uh, upwards of about 30 stations now, I think, the latest. They send those to the uh, uh, World Data Centers, and those are combined into an index. And what they do is they have a, a quiet day curve, which most of the time it is, and then they look and see how much the magnetic field deviates in the magnetic field reading from that. And they have a, a chart that relates that deviation to a number, and they send that number it's a logarithmic number between zero and nine for KP. Um, just like the uh, Richter scale, it's a logarithmic number. And so th these are logs essentially. And uh, AP index is a linear index that is related to it. So a lot of people use AP because it's linear. Most of the world uses KP because that's the oldest one. It's been used since the uh, 1800s to uh, record uh, geomagnetic activity. And this, these are different KP indices over here. And you can see green is just normal. And you can see that it got uh, the red ones over here. So that's the background for the solar activity. This is what was observed. These are their rate readings of the heights of their satellites. I believe that we're over in here. And I think this is the perigee distance down at 200. And I think they have a, an apogee up here. In, uh, distance up here. Typically, these call you can see everything occurs in pairs: perigee and apogee. And apogee is farthest away, perigee is closest. And so down here is the density. As you can see, as you approach the, this period over here, the density went up. And you can see down here the f10.7 flux went way up, up to 150 or so. And this is what results. This is one of the satellites actually coming in. They were able to get pictures. Um, uh, of, of the Starlinks entering into the Earth's atmosphere over Puerto Rico. So that's basically the story. They launched a bunch of satellites. They had them in a low altitude parking orbit, which makes sense when you think about it. 
but they didn't, they probably should have been monitoring the solar activity and predictions, uh, depending on when and where they launched. Uh, most people don't consider solar activity in launches. JPL is starting to, uh, because I'll give you an example. It uh, turned out not to be too serious for us, but we launched the Galileo spacecraft into the um, March 89 storm. <laughs> well, the September one, the worst one, and to, right into the severe solar proton event. And uh, there was, it, could, it was sort of predicted. So we do now take some steps at JPL to see if what the solar activity is going to be, if we think we might have a sensitive satellite. But by and large, uh, most people don't look at that. They just want the weather on the earth to be good. They don't look at the solar weather. I think that in the future, you're going to have to do a holistic approach and you're going to have to uh, think more and more about what the uh, solar activity is going to be, or at least try to get a prediction. Certainly for a long-term mission, you wanna know if you're going into solar max or solar minimum. Uh, there's 11 year cycle of solar activity and uh, you, you can play games with that and uh, work it and try to uh, do your launch at solar minimum for some reasons and solar max at other reasons. So that's basically it. Um, I wanna stress again, space is not empty and the space environment needs to be considered at every phase of your project. Most people just look at uh, how it's, what the thermal properties of the, material, the satellite are gonna be and whether it gets hot. Some people are increasingly are looking at the radiation effects from dose and single event upset or latch up. Those are areas that I work in extensively. And uh, we, we basically tear the satellite apart at JPL with every, looking at every, every, every part, tying that to the solar, weather that we expect to see are the radiation belts like at Jupiter, which are intense. And then we uh, pick parts or put shielding on them accordingly. Uh, often with the CubeSats, people are not willing to do that. They don't have the time, the money, or the mass. Mass is one of the big issues with a lot of the solar weather effects. Monitoring the environment is becoming more and more common. And we're finally, since I entered the field back in the early 70s, there was very little uh, real-time monitoring or even the ability to get the forecasts. I've worked with the uh, World Data Centers for many years and with Boulder and uh, I've visited them and they're very competent and they've really expanded their activities. In fact, NASA has the CCNC uh, for doing its own uh, specific forecasts and such these days. And so we're taking it more and more seriously. As you can see from the Skylink, uh, maybe you need to take it even more seriously for the atmospheric drag. And given the race to populate the lower Earth orbital environment, the space environment is going to play a real role in the survivability of those satellites, particularly at low altitudes and at, and, uh, at high altitudes from the radiation environment and polar orbits for the radiation and the drag environment. And any manned missions, of course, are particularly sensitive to the space environment. And it's one of the reasons that's limiting our going to Mars right now is because of the uh, galactic cosmic ray background radiation is a major threat to the astronauts. So I'm here trying to educate you spacecraft designers and users in, their, in the effects and trying to describe some of the mitigation techniques. What I didn't mention for the drag is one of my bosses back in the Air Force days uh, figured out for the Air Force, if they wanted their satellites to, to stay on orbit longer, they just simply had to put lead in it uh, because that create, increases the mass of the satellite and decreases the drag on the, the, uh, the uh, effects of drag on the satellite. So uh, as it counterintuitive as it sounds, you get small, small area, big mass. That's how you stay in orbit. And uh, so if you can fly a lead CubeSat, it might stay up a lot longer than an aluminum satellite. So that's about it. I will uh, conclude with, with a sales pitch. These are three of, my, three, of, three of the books I've produced. I have some others, but uh, the first one on the left over here is the uh, Space Systems Interaction with Earth Space Environment. It's about 300 to 400 pages. Uh, I published that back in the 70s. It is dated, however, it has, the original Kessler paper in it on the Kessler syndrome 
for sp uh, space debris. Uh, it also is an AIAA publication. And uh, it's based, I think we sold about a thousand of that. The middle one is, I produced this with Daniel Hastings. He's professor at MIT, head of the chair of the Department of Aerospace Engineering. I think he's Dean now, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, that, that was taught for many years at uh, MIT. Um, you, and uh, anyway, that's, a, that's still available. On the right's my newest one, and that's available both as uh, this book uh, through JPL, Caltech, and Wiley. You, you can actually get it through Caltech also. And it's uh, available also as, an, as the NASA guidelines. This is the book version of it, which makes it a little bit easier to get a hold of. So that's it. And Ken, did I manage to take a little time? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's amazing with more uh, uh, great detail. <laughs> I almost <laughs> caught you up. Did I catch you up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, thank you so much. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. You right, Penny. Tell, you should tell the audience you told me the opposite, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, oh. you made it. You made it. That's uh, it's wonderful. All right, and so let's see if I got any chat questions. All right, uh, I'm not okay. Not questions. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I have a list of questions, but th th let me first ask the audience. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, hi folks, this is great opportunity. You know, Dr. Garrett is really the international expert on this subject, so uh, he's here with us. So. Uh, if you let us know, you know, you can click raise hand. If you don't know how to do it, please type in the chat. Uh, we will enable your mic so you can speak out your question, please. You know, this is a great opportunity. Um, so while you, you are uh, trying to, oh, Brandon, great. Brandon, one second, we'll enable your mic. Brandon, here. Brandon, talk slowly so we can kill time. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, um, are you able to hear me all right? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay, um, I was just curious uh, about uh, some of the comments you made regarding the, uh, I think you said it was the uh, recorded as like 20 kilovolts to 80 kilovolts uh, potential on instruments. Yeah, don't, don't, right? well, I don't believe the 80 kilovolts, though one of my colleagues is, is very strong on that. Uh, I've seen up to 20 to 30 kilovolts myself. Okay, but still in a 20 to 30 kilovolt range. Right, it um, takes 100 kilovolts, to, 100 volts to cause an arc. If we've determined a differential on a satellite, so it's a big issue. Surface, there's two forms of surface charging. One is you get isolated electrical surfaces on your spacecraft, in a, say in an aurora or at midnight at geosynchronous orbit, and uh, you can get arcing and sparking. Hmm. Um, I was curious as to whether or not the given. I mean, I suppose it's not super regular as far as timing wise but uh was that mostly just from the uh the corona mass ejections or was that uh, also present like uh, during solar flares that pass over the uh, same area any kind of geomagnetic activity that causes aurora uh can cause the, the enhancements back there plus there is typically uh an average environment out there that can cause charging uh, the aurora are the worst things, but it, it, as you saw, aurora occur maybe, you know, what, two or three times a month or something. And uh, so that's typical, just low level geomagnetic storms. But we've seen some satellites that arc all the time. Uh, at least that's the claim by the same guy that claimed 80 kilovolts. <laughs> mm. He says he could, we have, we have evidence and I, I don't dispute him that claims that the solar arrays, if not properly designed, can arc almost continuously. And what I mean by that is it turns out that if you lay out your solar array wrong, uh, and people will typically run solar arrays at up to 100 volts or more. If you have the uh, two chains of cells where one cell is po positive, and the other cell is uh, one next to it is negative at about 100 volts differential, uh, we've shown that that can cause severe arcing. Uh, I won't name the customer, but uh, we worked with one of our customers, uh, consulted with them for some time over that problem, and they found out if they rewired the solar arrays, all their problems went away, but their solar arrays were blowing out. So you have all kinds of arcing problems on potentially on the surface of spacecraft. And the one that we worry the most about is not even that. 
It's the high energy electrons that can pin anything above about uh, uh, 50, 60 uh, uh, keV. We typically use 100 keV. Can pin electron can penetrate into the surface and build up charge. The protons and ions of that energy stop at the surface. They don't go in. They have to get to much higher energies before they penetrate. Therefore, there are a lot less of them. So you can build up in dielectrics in glass, like glass lenses and things of that nature. You can build up charge uh, in the radiation belts or from a, a coronal mass ejection type thing. The coronal mass ejections though we usually don't think of as causing charging. They think of them primarily as proton radiation sources. The, uh, cr the coronal mass ejections and geomagnetic storm uh, inducing flares, however, cause heat up the electrons at the earth. At Jupiter, we have just intense electron radiation belts, really intense ones around Europa and Io. They'll fry your eyeballs and you'll die like in minutes. Jesus. Okay. Um, well, I guess that would lead me to this question then. Uh, I'm, I'm just a student, so maybe this is just a stupid like idea or question, but just out of curiosity, has any thought been given as to um, potentially finding a way to harness the ability to store all of that energy when it yeah. happens? Yes, yes. There's been a lot of a lot of talk about that. No, no success. There are a bunch of different things that you can do. Uh, the, the simplest thing is you can put a plate that's in the sunlight and put a plate that's in the shadow. Uh, let the sunlight drive photoelectrons from the front plate, and then you can drive a you can drive a current between them. Not mm. much. It's it's nanoamps per square centimeter to give you an idea. So you have to have a lot of square centimeters. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's it's more of an area problem than to collect what's needed then. Well, that's part of it. And okay. the, it's basically the currents are very low. You're, right. Like I say, you're talking on the order of nanoamps and uh, picoamps in some cases. But no, people have ta are talking about that right now. Uh, people have talked about using that technique to discharge the satellite. In other words, you let it, you put little wires on there like you would for lightning arresters, and you mm. let the charge bleed off. And you can use that as, a, as, a, as an energy source. You see, you're driving a current. Anytime you can drive a current. It turns out there are much better ways of doing that, though. Uh, for example, V cross B. The Earth's magnetic field um, is, is uh, uh, what is it, 100 millivolts per meter? Uh, you can drive, uh, you can, they've run out of space tether. In fact, we ran out of tether about, uh, they were going to run out to 100 kilometers off the space shuttle. They got it about three kilometers and it threw about a foot long arc. <laughs> the space shuttle and melted the, melted the tether and scared them. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, um... you got a V from the satellite, you got a B from the planet. And from that, you can get an electric field. And then in the solar wind, the solar wind is a charged plasma. So you can bias a, a fine net and use that to repel the uh, uh, ion, get push against the ions, which are heavier than the electrons. And you can get, and people claim, uh, I'm not sure they've tried that yet. They, I think some Europeans may have to, to actually use that technique to drive a satellite. Oh, okay, so it hasn't actually been tested yet, then practically. I think so. It may have been. You should check on it. But that's electric. It's a it's an electric sail. It's called an electric sail. You know, I, I I was thinking about that when you mentioned the uh, the need for a wide area, like uh, if deploying very large. Uh, I I only know them as solar sails, but uh, in kind of a, uh, electric sail, as you mentioned, would that be something that would possibly make that a viable way to do it? Uh, um, yes, and that's like injury. Yes, and right now we're just now getting into the solar sail business. I've been on several solar sail uh, projects. Unfortunately, none of mine have flown. The uh, Planetary Society has successfully flown one. It turns out, though, that the, that, that the technique has been uh, definitively proven. I don't know if you ever heard of the ECHO satellites. Look up ECHO-1, ECHO-2 satellite. The solar mm -hmm. pressure on those satellites, they basically thought they could fly a big... Uh, it was a 50, 100 foot uh, balloon, mylar balloon, and reflect radio waves off of it uh, to, as a communication satellite. It didn't, didn't work too well for that, but they, they were interesting. They flew two or three of them. And the bottom line was every time they came in the sunlight, they'd be knocked about 10 kilometers in orbit from the sunlight. 
<laughs> it's mm. impressive. It's very impressive. They, they work beautifully as solar sails. So, so is that because of all the the, the uh, photons? Part, photons. Yeah, the uh, the like the all the the mass hitting it from the from the very small particles, but still in but, large quantity. Well, it's the sunlight. It's the photons. Oh, okay. When a photon reflects off, it uh, h nu equals an energy, and so you can one half mv squared. You can relate it to that, and the sunlight's pretty intense. You know, it's a one point three kilowatts per square meter, and um, it shines on you. It it does a lot, and that that's a significant pressure, very low level though. But uh, the Planetary Society is currently flying a, a solar sa sail right now around the Earth and raising and lowering its orbit. And uh, by the same token, uh, I was on part of Team Lagarde that was designed a 40 meter one. Unfortunately, we weren't, uh, weren't approved for launch. Uh, some of my friends have built up to 100 meter solar sails, but uh, weren't able to launch them. But uh, the, the, I, we know it works. Mariner 4, for example, had little solar sails on it that were used to ad do attitude control, little vanes. Hmm. Just from the so, sunlight. That's just the sunlight. That's not even from the electric the charge. The plat the electric charge, if you can couple it, is 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 uh, much higher. The problem is in the plasma, the solar wind is highly variable. Ah, uh, okay. So there's no consistency to get like a a consistent. Uh... Hell, it even goes away, but that's only mm. happened. That's only happened once in the space age. The solar wind did go away <laughs> one time for about three days. Surprised everybody. <laughs> That's interesting. Is the, did, was there any theories to why it uh, yeah. disappeared? It, 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 well, since I'm killing time, <laughs> 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 it turns out that the uh, it turns out that Parker and Chamberlain were the two great uh, proponents of the solar of solar wind theory. Uh, Parker Parker assumed that the solar wind went supersonic somewhere near the sun and expanded out, and he worked out the supersonic equations. Chamberlain worked out, assumed that the solar wind never went supersonic. And as a result of that, he worked out a different set of equations. And his equations were proven perfectly correct when the sun went away. But Parker is 99.9% .9 of the time. Chamberlain was 1% of the time, less than 1% of the time. So guess who, got, guess who got the probe named after him? The reason it goes supersonic is because if you look at the way the gas expands out from the sun, uh, one over r squared, and you have gravity holding it back, and gravity falls off as one over r squared. So the bottom line is you have a nozzle. You have a de Laval nozzle, it turns out. And the question is, what's the temperature of the, of the solar atmosphere at the base of the base of the atmosphere, at the top of the atmosphere? And that's what the solar probe is investigating right now. We still don't know why it goes, why it turns out to be supersonic there, but we think, we, we think we're beginning to know there's a bunch of shock waves generated on the surface of the sun that keep the plasma shocked up to high velocities at that point. Oh, okay, kind of like ripples in, in the water then like reinforcing exactly. each other. And they, yeah, and they build up at, at just the right distance. And every so often they don't, and <laughs> the solar wind goes away. <laughs> that's interesting. So. In that view, it could kind of be seen as space is like a large body of water to some extent. Then yes, and if you huh. look at the, if you look at the planets and you look at their magnetospheres, uh, have have Ken send me your email, and I will send you a chart showing all the magnetospheres that I produced for NASA. I have a oh, big, that that would be amazing, sir. I have a big chart. Uh, so let I'll, uh, so Ken get his email and let me know. All right. Yes, we'll do. And anyway, all the planets have uh, have a form of a magnetosphere. Even even the little bitty comets and the and the asteroids have a uh, basically a comet uh, like feature around them from the plasma and the solar wind interacting with them. Mm. It's all very fascinating. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I might just have to do that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, uh, that 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 is the end of my questions, I suppose. But I really appreciate you taking the time to answer them. Okay, I I, I think Ken does too. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, you got any more questions for me?
oh, how are images of the sun captured? Uh, well, the one I, first of all, you, you can go out and aim your camera at the sun, but I wouldn't do it. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> but uh, sorry, sorry. What, uh, what, I, what you, you can buy uh, the eclipse filters. If you remember, we had a recent solar eclipse in 2017, and I went out and bought uh, some little filters that fit over my, uh, uh, fit over my <laughs> binoculars, and you can take very good pictures of the sun that way. The other thing you could do is you can make a pinhole and project the image of the sun uh, in, into a shadowed region, and you can take pictures that way. And people have done that for generations. That's the way they actually, one of the ways they actually used to track sunspots. In fact, they'd still track sunspots that way, I believe, uh, with huge pinhole uh, the telescopes. But the uh, other way you do it is the H alpha that I use. They, they, have, they have two types of telescopes that you can buy, H alpha and calcium. And Coronado, or uh, uh, Mead uh, bought out Coronado, and Mead I think was recently bought out by Oceanside or Ocean View. Anyway, um, you can look online for Coronado Space Telescopes. And what they do is they sell a filter, and it, uh, what it does is it cuts out, it, it picks the H alpha line of the sun, which is where hydrogen absorbs. A radiation, and you put you pick that line, and there's not much sunlight there. So by picking that line, you you can actually look directly at the sun. They do that for a, a bunch of other very narrow wavelength frequencies. The commercial ones are cal, uh, as I said, are calcium and uh, H alpha. But uh, the scientists will take 30, 40 different wavelengths. And each wavelength reveals something slightly different. You take very, very narrow frequency filters so that you cut out 99.99% of the sunlight. That's how you take solar pictures. Great. So RP, do you want to say uh, anything? RP is actually our uh, the other way Los Angeles, Las Vegas section, uh, STEM K-12 outreach chair. So she's uh, uh, like a award-winning educator. So Arby, do you want to say a few words, or basically the answer was a uh, question was answered? Sure, Ken. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Garrett, for coming and sharing such wonderful knowledge. I work with a lot of students, and again, no matter how much the information is in the textbook, it's so different when a professional that's actually used it for their career um, brings it to life. So I want to thank you. Uh, when it comes to some of the lessons teachers have given about the magnetic field. Sometimes there's always difficulty for students to understand it since it's so abstract. Do you have any suggestions on how to approach teaching it to high school students or middle school students when they have kind of difficulty with the concept of magnetism as it relates to the earth and the sun? It's, well, the standard is the bar magnet. You take a bar magnet, you lay it down, hopefully a very strong bar magnet. You put a piece of paper on top of it and you sprinkle iron filings. And that forms a beautiful dipole. The iron filings line up along the magnetic field lines. They act as little magnets. And that is the number one way to illustrate the magnetic field. And then you can, underneath, you can move another magnet up and you can see how they affect each other, how there's, an, how there's a, a positive uh, north, south, whatever you want to call it, that they're two similar poles repel each other. And you can see it with the iron filings and you can do then to attract each other. I strongly remember that that's by far the best way to do it. The other thing to do is to make an electromagnet. Uh, you take a nail or something like that and you wrap wire around it and attach it to a battery and that makes a magnet. And uh, then the, the next step is if you, if you have the time, um, there's a UNESCO book that they put out many years ago um, I think I have it. If, if you write me, I can send you the, the reference, but it uh, has a whole bunch of science experiments in there. And it has a bunch, even how to make a little electro, make a magnetic motor just out of nails and wire and a battery. And I think those are the, the those three, three things uh, illustrate most of the principles of magnetism, electromagnetism. Because the, mo the motor illustrates how, how the, the V cross B effects the, uh, the uh, um, uh, 
bar magnet shows how you get the magnetic field lines. And uh, I think that, that answers your question pretty much. But Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Garrett. These days with students and their um, little bit of an addiction to technology, I still feel the um, concept of magnetism. It's not until you see it, like you said, the magnet and the fillings, then you realize those are more magic tricks than your phone can do. So I'll definitely reach out to you for the UNESCO book because the more I'm trying to help teachers and support them to bring the science to life and not be reliant on technology, it really is helping. So I appreciate those ideas. By the way, I don't know if y'all, uh, anybody's seen it yet, but uh, go online, you can get a levitated moon globe. There's a little bitty globe about four inches across. It floats about an inch above a base. It's suspended by magnets. It's hard, really hard to get it to be in the right position, but once you do it, it works. <laughs> it floats about an inch above, it rotates and lights up, and it's not connected to anything but electromagnetics. <laughs> I'll be sure to check that out. Thanks again. Yeah, you can also get an NFL helmet that does the same thing. <laughs> Uh, okay, I see Robert seems to have a comment. So, Robert, do you want to say something? Mr. Yes. So, were, so, Dr. Garrett was mentioning that uh, the uh, effects of the work keeping people from doing interplanetary travel, what was the effects of the coronal mass in injections on the astronauts on the space station? All right, let's, well, first of all, understand that the space station even it does get to fairly high latitude. So it does get some of those proton events that I talked about. It's, uh, remember it was designed so they would go over Russia. And so the Russians can, la Russians launch to it. So I think it's what 57 degrees, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's not 23 and a half degrees. Uh, if you launch into a 23 and a half degree low altitude orbit, you're protected almost entirely by the dipole field of the earth. Um, except when you get those big coronal mass ejections. Um, the bottom line is that the, here are the different effects that you have to take into account for the astronauts. And the first one, of course, is total dose. And it's millirads per day at, uh, if I remember, at space station altitudes. And that's just simply the background radiation coming from outer space. It's a uh, large part of it is the trapped radiation. And then you get on top of that, you get what are known as cosmic rays. The galactic cosmic rays penetrate here to the ground. You and I would not be here if there weren't for the galactic cosmic rays, which have caused uh, genetic mutations. Uh, it's, I, I'm pretty sure that's what did it because uh, they knock on chromosome or whatever they do, they change your DNA and stuff. They're very high energy. You're talking about, um, instead of million, millions of electron volts, you're talking about uh, billions of electron volts in energy and even up to hundreds of billions. I think 10 to the 23 electron volts is the uh, highest energy recorded. And these are particles that are generated originally by uh, supernovas, super solar flares, whatever you want to know, and throughout the, the uh, universe, particularly in our own galaxy. And these are typically heavy ions. Uh, they fall into three groups. Uh, over time, nuclei, nuclei decay into stable ones. And so you basically got oxygen, uh, let's see, iron and carbon are the, the ray groups. The uh, nucleuses around those are the main ones. And these things clump through the universe like mad and uh, they'll penetrate and cause, they literally go through you. And as they go through you, they dump energy. Uh, they ionize or if, uh, God forbid they hit a nucleus, they actually knock the nucleus on. And in some cases they can actually transmute the elements in, in a spacecraft. Uh, that's the worst, the galactic cosmic rays. The sun puts out uh, cosmic rays also. They're typically lower energy. They're in the, in the tens of MeV to 100 MeV range, but they also put in the, the di slightly different composition. Their carbon, uh, their families of, of nucleuses are slightly different, but those are the particles that are put out in certain terms of solar flares and coronal mass ejections. Now, the thing with, with solar flares and coronal mass ejections is we have some predictive ability and they're not as energetic typically as these GCRs. And so uh, what has been done, and I, I've actually worn, they actually designed a lead jacket for astronauts. I got to try it on. <laughs> 
<laughs> they what they do is every time they bring water up to the space station and stuff, they have a root area in there where they pile up all the water and, mass, and all the mass they can find. And so if they they told that there's a, a coronal mass ejection or a solar flare coming, they can they can go spend time behind all this water, the jugs of water and everything, and they literally do that. Um, the other thing you can do, the big danger is if you're on EVA. And then you have to be able, they have to be able to give them a half an hour, I think it is, to get back in from the EVA. But they do watch that. And they do, by the way, they do the same thing for that, for the Aurora and the spacecraft charging. Um, they found that astronauts can be discharged to and killed. And uh, we haven't killed any astronauts. We killed some sheep in an astronaut suit, but it, it works. <laughs> so. That's the GCR are the most dangerous because we can't stop them. They are a low level everywhere. And in space, you don't have the magnetic field of the Earth to cut off the lower energy ones. There's more at low energies, so the Earth's field helps us. That's why we're still here. Uh, if you didn't have the magnetic field, uh, you'd be in pretty bad shape. Maybe if you're living in a European ocean or something like that. The other things that they worry about it's just plain dose. And that's from the protons and the pro a lot more protons, but they're not very massive. And they just, they basically uh, can go, go into your body and they deposit energy. And that's what uh, a rad is, radiation equivalent dose. And uh, so you figure out that I think it's 500 rads uh, will just about kill you. Uh, 100, I think uh, 30 rads is, uh, what uh, gives you about the equivalent of the likelihood of getting cancer from a uh, from smoking. And so that's currently, as far as I know, that's the limit. They use the smoking criteria for astronauts. Uh, they also use the similar thing for pilots. Uh, I've, been, I've been interviewed on this on television a few times about uh, planes flying into the Aurora and things like that. And yes, you get Aurora. They will divert airline flights now if they know there's a, a coronal mass ejection or a solar proton event. There's a thing called a polar capped absorption event where it's a huge, humongous coronal mass ejection, like the 89 one. Uh, that, just, that just floods the polar cap with high energy particles and does severe damage to anything and so you do not want to be flying in one of those storms. And you're, you're high enough up that you can get a fairly dose. I'd, I've worked with a group up until recently that was flying monitors on airplanes and we were trying to chart that. That help? It does, thank you. Ken, am I procrastinating enough? <laughs> <laughs> I can draw yeah, this yeah. out as long as you've got questions. <laughs> yeah, you are so good. <laughs> Just, uh, just, uh, uh, you know, more, more details. Yes. Um. I actually, um, if anybody has more questions, please, uh, click raise hand. I also have more questions, but, uh, I think Dr. Gary mentioned we can, uh, uh, ask the next speaker if she has more to say, so she can start earlier, right? I think you mentioned it. So let me ask Leia. Leia, um, I know uh, you are here. Uh, initially you have a 15 minute talk. Would you be able to? Talk about five or ten more minutes. If not, we'll we'll ask Dr. Garrett more questions. <laughs> oh, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much. I only prepared about ten to fifteen minutes, so okay. please feel free to take take the okay. stage. Keep keep the stage, um, Dr. Garrett. And no, 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 no. We can ask her <laughs> questions. We can ask her questions. <laughs> Very pointed question. Yes. 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 Okay, Dr. Garrett, actually, uh, you mentioned about the sister of Richard Feynman. That sounds interesting, though. It's kind of uh, history. Uh, can you say a few words about, you know, uh, how you got to work with her or those things? Uh, she's a very, was a very close friend of mine. She just died last year. Um, she was Richard Feynman's younger sister. And she was like about 10 years younger, or not quite 10 years younger than he was. And um, they grew, obviously grew up together, and she relates of, this, of him using doing experiments on her, trying to see how much he could shock her. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And uh, he would pay her. He would pay her to get shocked. <laughs> she told I see. Me. I see. 
that's that's something uh, 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 Dr. Feynman never wrote in his books. No, no, she did. It's in. It's, I think it's in, in one of the books, though. Anyway, uh, so she. It's in some of the uh, stories about her. I I have a, num a num I've collected all of them on her, but no, uh, I did my thesis back in 1970 on work that she did. She was one of the early pioneers of figuring out how the solar wind affected geomagnetic storms. Uh, she uh, did a correlation between the magnetic field in the sun and the uh, geomagnetic indices, KP and AP, and uh, a number of other phenomena in the atmosphere. And uh, she verified that and was very well known for doing that. And uh, uh, as a result of working on my thesis on her stuff, I, got, I met her at some conferences. And then when I was uh, assigned in 74 to the military uh, lab up in, uh, uh, Cam in Cambridge, Mass., uh, she came to work with us there as a contractor, and I got to know her real well. And then after, after I finished up, after I left active duty in 1980 and came out to JPL, uh, I was appointed a group supervisor. And I brought her out to my to join our group at JPL when she she wanted to be out here with Richard. Richard was had cancer at the time and was dying, and she wanted to come out and be with him. And so she came out, and I assigned her a, a project to come up with the probability of coronal mass ejections, actually of solar proton events, of predicting solar proton events. She wrote the seminal paper on that as a result of that, and she made a, a, some very brilliant discoveries on how, to, how the statistics, how you actually can predict um, how many solar proton events and when, uh, what strength they'll be and when, and things like that. And uh, she uh, uh, was, became very famous for that and went on to become one of the top scientists at JPL. Uh, the story goes, and she's told this to me many, many times, that um, she, when she was going to college, uh, she had to discuss, had to come up with a field of uh, to be in, and she was discouraged from going to science. So of course she wanted to go into science uh, by the you know by the society, and she went into physics and she did extremely well in physics, and she talked with Richard about it, and uh, she, after she got her PhD, and they made a pact. Richard agreed he would never do anything in space physics in space and astronomy. She was given that entire field by the family, by him. Wow, that's so and, interesting. <laughs> and, and so that's what she was noted for. Uh, I'd say two years ago, they had one of his 100th birthday or something like that. She lived to be like 98, I think. Anyway, um, and I, I saw her like a, a few weeks before she died. Uh, <laughs> crying a little bit. I gave part of the eulogy. Uh, she was a very close friend. And uh, anyway. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating story. I, I actually, for some reason, I, I thought that there was no other, um, uh, in uh, Richard Feynman family, there was no other uh, physicist because, you know, when I read uh, his book, he, he, he basically said his son become a computer scientist. I think his daughter was, was not in, in the science field. Uh, so I, I, I saw that maybe in his family, there's, he was the only physicist. Nope. <laughs> I, I see. Part, of the, part of the problem is she got married and she changed her name to Hirschberg. But, but, I see. But then she got divorced and went back to using Feynman. I see. That's, that's just amazing. That, uh, but did you, did you uh, meet uh, Richard Feynman yourself? Nope, you, I, was a, I was a coward. She invited me over several times, but I, I was see. shy. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I will be the, I will be so afraid to to meet uh, meet him too. You know, he and he he he, he says things very out front. You know, who knows what he will say. You know. Anyway, no, I she did invite me over, and I didn't go. <laughs> I see. I see. So she offered that. I see. Yeah, but no, she we we, we did a lot with her. No, I, I uh, we were close friends. I know, I know, I know. I understand. It's very close. I can I can see from what you're saying. Very dear friend. Very close. Uh, very sad to see her go. You know, I understand. Yeah. Anyway, they had uh, they had his hundredth birthday down at uh, Caltech. It was the year before last, and she was the uh, guest of honor. 
Ah, I see, I see, I see. She, I she, see. Re she related a lot of these stories and uh, things like, I don't know if you've heard the ant story. He, uh, he found out that he followed an ant trail and found out that he could break it up and he put a little, little piece of paper and the ants would run on the paper and he'd move it over to another spot and then go off. <laughs> I see, I see. <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's, there are lots of Feynman stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually, uh, you know, of course, the, the most one I, I, I look into is the, the Space Shuttle Challenger, uh, Rogers Commission. That's I, I think that's a, a, a big story. But of course, the other other like playing drums, you know, a lot of things, you know, that's of course also fascinating. Well, my family was involved in the shuttle. My uncle was the designer of the boosters. Oh, okay. Uh oh, he was he was vice president of Thiokol Chemical. And, Chemical, okay, I see. And he he designed the Thiokol boosters, and he he quit over the O-ring issue. He refused to put O-rings in. I see, I see, I see. It turned see. out that, that it turned out that uh, Thiokol built a big plant in Georgia, and they were going to flo uh, float the 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 seamless boosters down for the shuttle launches, but a political decision was made. To put them, I believe it was uh, at the Michaud or wherever it was over in Louisiana, Mississippi area, and to put to get those over to uh, uh, Canaveral, they had to put put them uh, break them up into uh, segmented and had to use O rings. I see. I I, I think yeah. I, there's a story. A couple. Of, I think the Theocore, the manager, uh, Mr. McDonald. And some engineer refused to sign the launch launch order. Uh, I think there's a kind of story. Of course, Richard Feynman and the Russia Commission. You have Neil Armstrong, uh, Chuck Yeager. You know all the big shots. And uh, but your your story. This is fascinating. I didn't know that uh, uh, you 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 have a family member. Uh, uh, you know involved. That that's very wonderful. Which to learn more from you. You know uh, he was. Uh, by the way, he was he was president of the uh, uh, Marshall. Uh, Rocket uh, Society. Ah, I see. I see. And pictures of him and von Braun. Um, I see. But no, he he quit over the O rings. He would. I know. He refused to build them. <laughs> I see. I see. I see. Well, I mean, we we should, we, uh, we can learn more about this fascinating story uh, from you, and of course, also Roswell. <laughs> the the the. Uh, Have we killed enough alien. time yet? Have we killed enough time yet? Yes, it's almost time. <laughs> You are, you are so good. That's a story. Yeah, wonderful. I, I can I can talk forever, but no, the the what he mentioned is I I'm I'm a, Ro, a Roswell person. I grew up in Roswell. I was born nine months after the landing. Yeah, this fascinating story. Okay, so I think uh, it, it's uh, about time. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Gary. This is a fantastic lecture and uh, lots of uh, 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 wonderful question answer and uh, uh, amazing stories. Uh, really, truly, highly, highly appreciate. So stay in touch. Uh, uh, we'll invite you back again and when you are ready and uh, uh, learn more from you on the very exciting topic, uh, space weather, space environment and those things and also uh, the, the wonderful story you've been telling us. Uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Garrett. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Leia. Uh, she is uh, this uh, uh, is more in the STEM. And as you know, STEM is very important, bring up the uh, next generation and the train uh, the teachers for readiness, for education uh, to, to help our next generation. So um, I'm putting up the slide, so let me see. So Leia, let's see, let's see, sorry, um, it passed the slides, we're almost there. So this doctor, so Leia is uh, joined, uh, she is a teaching fellowship recruiter in, in COPS and uh, she joined in COPS in August, 2021 to support recruitment efforts in Southern California. Uh, the Indiana native uh, relocated, relocated to Los Angeles after graduating from the Paul University in 2020, where she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Education Studies. Being a first-generation college graduate, uh, she has a strong passion and a commitment uh, to improving the educational opportunities for low-income students and the student of color. Uh, her topic up, uh, briefing today is use your STEM industry experience to challenge lives. So welcome, uh, Leah. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I do have a small presentation that I'm going to share. Um, just give me a few seconds to pull that up. And I'm really excited to um, be here and share more about Encore. Uh, we saw the slide briefly. Now it disappeared. One moment. Sorry about that. I must have clicked it off, not even knowing. Okay. All right. All right. Can everyone see my screen now? Uh, yes, I can see it. Awesome. RP, can you Perfect. see it? RP. Oh, yes, I can see it. It looks beautiful. Thank you so much. All right, so as I said, thank you for having me. Uh, I am Leah Rodriguez. I'm the Teaching Fellowship Recruiter here for Encore. Um, today, I'm gonna tell you a bit about Encore, kind of our mission, um, our fellowship, which we offer, which is the three-step three, three step track um, to getting STEM industry professionals to transition to a career of teaching in a low-income school. Um, and we also have a tutor program for those who are not ready to transition, but let me just jump right over. So on the screen um, is our small but mighty team here at Encore. Um, on the left side, we have our recruitment team, myself, Sue, and Ashley. And then on the right side, we have the program team. So all of the program team members that you see on, on your screen um, are uh, they kind of own a different region that we work with here at Encore. And for the fellowship, uh, you will receive one of, the, one of the program coordinators on the screen that is in your region in order to counsel you and just kind of help you, uh, give you guidance for credentialing and just making sure that you reach your end goal here with Encore. And all of the program coordinators have been teachers at some point. So they have made that transition before. Um, so they're very, very knowledgeable about um, what that process looks like. And um, they provide a lot of support along the way for the fellowship. Now on the left side, as I mentioned, that is my team, the recruitment team. Uh, my name is Leah Rodriguez. As you heard um, from my like little bio, I am a first generation college graduate from Indiana. Um, so I'm a long, long ways from my home, but I am so grateful to be working with Encore because not only am I a first generation college grad, um, but I come from low income backgrounds, uh, schooling and just neighborhoods in general. So. This work is very near and dear to my heart because I have had great teachers in my even low income classrooms that have made such a difference um, and really encouraged me to continue to succeed. Um, so I'm happy to be on the other end, finding those uh, great teachers that other students someday will be presenting and speaking highly of them about. All right, so here at Encore, we believe that all students should have access to a great STEM education and opportunities. But unfortunately, that's currently not the case. Uh, there are crisis level teacher shortages in California and Colorado, which are just two of the regions that Encore is serving. Um, but literally all over the United States, um, we are seeing teacher shortages and decreases in teacher prep programs. So we are seeing that people are not wanting to be teachers. Uh, so thinking about what impact that makes in those classrooms, because uh, the shortage are the shortages are um, even more pronounced when we look at schools that have high numbers of students of color um, and those low income schools and families. So this is where you as a, a STEM professional would come in. You may have the uh, interest to be involved in public education or maybe um, you wanna give back and make a difference through teaching or perhaps you're considering career transitioning. Um, well, Encore right now, we're the only nonprofit in the nation that is enabling STEM professionals to make a career transition to teaching in a low risk, highly supported way. Um, and how we do this is by offering a fellowship, which is an innovative long term solution um, to enduring those STEM opportunity and literacy gaps that we see disproportionately limiting low income in those minority students and their opportunities that they have um, to succeed in the, in the education field and just um, in life in general. So we believe that uh, STEM industry leaders bring technical skills 
leadership and real world expertise to these public schools in order to deliver an authentic, rigorous and relevant STEM education to students who need it the most. So we all remember be, being students at some point and we also remember hearing this question, um, why are we learning this? Why is this important? Well, we understand that these STEM professionals in these roles as teachers have that um, experience and they, they can answer those questions and they can connect those dots, which is why it's so awesome and important um, the work that we're doing here at Encore. Um, and we annually impact over 38,000 students in low, uh, low income communities. And we also have an 88% five-year teacher retention rate. And, that, and I should mention that um, nearly 50% of, of um, teachers remain in low income districts after five years. So Encore has 88% versus that 50% 50, 50 that we see. Um, and I'm also proud to say that we bring diversity to the classroom. So about 45% of our fellows identify as teachers of color compared to the average of about 18% of teachers. And how we, how we have these awesome numbers is we believe that our support professional development and preparation um, really contribute to those rates. So speaking of support, um, Encore offers a lot of benefits as part of our fellowship program, because ultimately we want to ensure that you have the connections and experiences to thrive as a new teacher. Um, so you'll, ju you'll jumpstart your fellowship by volunteering as a guest teacher where, where you're gonna spend one semester observing, shadowing, and eventually teaching your own lesson with an experienced host teacher. Um, all of the host teachers, which Encore makes this pair for you, um, they've all had three or more years of teaching experience under their belt. Um, so it's a great chance to network and possibly make those potential future employment opportunity connections. Um, we also provide with your guest teaching experience, um, the support that you'll receive from your program team and your program coordinator. Um, again, they're gonna guide you through the process of earning a credential and being eligible to teach as a full-time teacher. Um, they are also going to observe you at that uh, school site and connect you with other fellows or schools, um, and they'll continue to prepare you um, for those teaching interviews and just support you all along the way um, as you enter into your own classroom. Now, in order to be fully credentialed um, in most states, you'll have to take some sort of exams. Um, and Encore does offer exam support, so we provide credentialing resources research and exam study materials, and our program coordinators have personal relationships with the different university partners and county offices of education that are around. Um, so they're, they're able to, um, again, coach you and make sure that you're succeeding as you um, are earning that teaching credential. We also offer um, a robust slate of professional development. We host three events per year that are all virtually virtual now. Um, they're called institutes. So we have a summer, fall and spring institute. And these institutes are practical interactive work sessions um, that will encourage uh, building teaching skills. And a few examples of some topics that would be at these institutes would be um, classroom management, behavior and instruction, instructional strategies, and perhaps like diversity and inclusion. Um, so right away, you're going to also receive online professional development modules through Google Classroom. Um, and this is also a space where you can connect with other fellows online and um, build a network with everyone here at Encore. On top of all of that, uh, you receive that cohort of peers. So everyone in our fellowship program is experiencing the same transition of coming from industry and going into teaching. Um, and we like to host gatherings throughout the year um, in order to build community and create uh, lots of spaces of communication so that you feel highly supported as you go through this process. And also, when you're going into a new industry, it's usually helpful that um, you create a network. So we hope that we do our part on that end by making sure that you are meeting with the right people and talking to the, uh, the correct teachers and getting all your answers, um, your questions answered so that you feel fully prepared by the time you get into a full-time classroom. 
Now we do have some eligibility, baseline eligibilities for our fellowship program. Um, so a big one is going to be that you have to live within an area that we serve. Um, so right now we're serving um, the greater Los Angeles area, the greater San Francisco Bay area, North Orange County, San Diego, Denver, and New York City, and also some parts of New Jersey. We are hoping to continue expanding, um, but right now you would have to live within the service area just because um, the beginning of the fellowship does begin with you doing that one semester of guest teaching. Um, on top of that, the also other very important part is that you are a STEM industry professional and our eligibility for that would be that you have one or more years of work experience or research experience um, in the industry or that you have an advanced degree in a STEM field. You also must be fully eligible to work in the US and hold an undergrad degree with a 2.5 or higher. And finally, you must not be um, holding a teaching credential since you will earn your credential as the second step of our fellowship. All right, um, so if you do decide to become a fellow, um, this is what your timeline would look, look like. Um, I'm not gonna dive in too deeply. You'll see this um, during the interview processes a bunch and we just wanna make sure that um, everyone understands that we have two um, routes that you can take and it's dependent on how quickly you wanna enter the classroom. Um, so if you can look and see those uh, big green boxes, that would be when you would be eligible to enter a classroom or as soon as you can enter one, depending on um, if you were to meet our deadline of the May 13th, um, which is our, our upcoming deadline. And basically, um, if you're someone who is super ready to be in a classroom ASAP, um, you would do an accelerated route, which would mean that you would be taking credentialing at the same time that you're going in to teach as a full-time teacher. Um, but most of our fellows do the standard route, which allows them more time um, and gives them more time to continue working in their industry positions um, because we don't we don't encourage anyone to stop their industry position until it's time to like become a full time teacher at the end of your fellowship when you're fully credentialed. Um, but the standard route would just give you more time to have um, just time to think and process the material and kind of uh, give you more more field time before making that huge transition and change into being a full time teacher. Um, again, this is a timeline you'll see. A, again, um, many times if you continue um, to have interest in our fellowship. All right, so um, I most of the all of the information I just gave you um, is about our fellowship, since I am um, in charge of that sort of uh, ends of our recruitment team. But we also have a program called the STEM X Tutor Program, and this is for STEM industry professionals that want to make an impact without making a career transition. Um, we know that's a huge thing to do, um, and we we know not everyone is ready to do that or is interested in doing that. Um, but if you have one year or one or more years of industry experience, you would be eligible for this program. You don't have to live within any specific region. Um, and you would be tutoring a middle schooler in math virtually for two hours per week. And this would be at a time that makes sense for both you and the student. Right now, all of our kids are um, from a school in one of our partner schools in Los Angeles, but we're hoping to expand into Colorado and hopefully our other um, regions as well. But again, this is something uh, less commitment, less of a change. And we also have info sessions on both the fellowship and um, the STEMX program. And those happen about two times a month, but you can find all of our events uh, to sign up for these webinars at encore.org slash events. And the next one for the STEMX program is going to be May 19th, 2022 at 9 a.m. So feel free to check it out um, or even sign up for the fellowship webinar if you want to learn even more um, than this quick 15 minute uh, session I'm giving you now. All right, so um, that actually brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for having me and listening. Um, 
we've all had great, great STEM educators or educators in general, and we've all had not so great educators. Um, and one thing's for sure, we, we know that there's an impact there one way or another. Um, so perhaps if you're interested in exploring the idea of a career transition, you would consider um, transitioning into a low income middle or high school so that you can teach and use your expertise to really um, make an impact on that school system. Um, I just wanted to draw our attention that we do have an upcoming deadline of our fiscal year of May 13th. Um, our process does roll over, so if you missed that, um, not really a big deal, but as far as the timeline I've showed you, if you're interested, May 13th would be your deadline. Um, and lastly, I just want to say um, thank you before I get off and that my information is listed on this screen. I'm so willing and would be happy to schedule any follow up calls or one on ones if you have any interest or perhaps um, know somebody who would be a great fit. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Leia. That's a, a wonderful uh, presentation. and. Uh... Uh, it's great thing you have been doing, you know, for low incomes and student and the training the teacher a career change. This is wonderful. So stay in touch. Uh, STEM is definitely uh, needed for for the future uh, space. So uh, now is our uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Peter Humphrey. Uh, let me see. Oh, Peter is there. Okay. Uh, so basically, um, Peter is the president uh, of the company called the ASMS. Uh, he's, this, uh, uh, he's also a design engineer, field engineer, technician with specialty in automation. Uh, his background includes large international projects in design, uh, the commissioning of equipment for automate, automated manufacturing, system for repairing space vehicles, airline cargo, uh, handling equipment. He holds a patent for space manufacturing uh, module, patent US number 79. AA096 space manufacturing module system and uh, method parent European number uh, 1796963 -96 space manufacturing uh, module system and method. Uh, his topic today is design and applications of the universal module. It's very exciting. So uh, to, uh, please take a look. It's a wonderful new space activity. So go ahead, Peter. Uh, Peter, can you? As to Peter, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, that's yeah. So uh, I'd like to appreciate the uh, Las Vegas, uh, Los Angeles, Vegas section of the uh, American Institute of. Eris I, 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 you know, and Ken for inviting me to present. So I'm the president of Advanced Space Manufacturing, and I'll go briefly over there because I've only got 30 minutes, so I've got a lot to cover. Uh, I'll go through the introduction, design, applications, and a brief overview here. The as you're aware, not there was a lot happening in the 60s and etc. And now with the private space industry, things are sort of, um, in aerospace, it never moves quick, but it's moving a little bit quicker. <laughs> so, and that, so the ASMS Universal Logistics Module is a disruptive technology, an innovation set to revolutionize space exploration with the development of a platform and architecture oh. of building colonies. The ASMS innovative space utility models are structure of unique benefits of upgradability and reconfigurability using a slideable platform on rollers. The first module was designed with double doors for full interior access, incorporating the international berthing docking mechanism standards. Uh, first utility mode providing colonization technology for in orbit as well as planets such as Moon, Mars, etc. So here's the function statement. Uh, I'll just let you read all that rather than me verbasing it. Basically, it could be an LEO or, you know, Phobos, Earth, Moon. It's, it's basically in situ. Ken, just tell me when you've had enough of that. Just say yes or no, and I'll move on to the next slide. You got okay. it? Got okay. It. All right, next one. Um, so these are the 
the user's equipment requirements. Yell out when you've had enough, Ken. Yes. Got it? Yes. All right, here. Parameters. So here's your spec sheet here. What the power is, thermal requirements, data, wild ass cost cut. WAG is wild ass cost estimate, but that was always moving target. Duration of experiment, 15 years. And we've got a tracked rover, which is at TRI level four. Orbit considerations, the usual suspects. Yell out when you've got it, everybody. Yes, can see it, yes. All right, next one. So, present day ISS entry ports are restricted by 39 inches over to pass through supplies and hardware. The ISS capability could be extended if new technologies and, and the hardware are brought into it. This gives the rise to the development of new entry means or future of LEO private company space stations. The ASMS patented space utility module with double door system and slider wall platform on rollers will provide a solution to this need. So new space, um, the, the unique benefit of this is double doors. And then this is the overview here of what a large scale um, modular factory or hotel, whatever the end customer wants to put in there. So basically what I'm showing here is the engineering data is sent to Ken. We'll just go use the astronaut in one of this module here where my mouse is moving. Then that information sent to the manufacturing module over here. And then you build the uh, trusses or if it's um, biotech that making um, biotechnology medicines or whatever you want to put in now, we are not going to tell you what to put inside these modules. That's up to the end customer. So here's um, how this is. This is our first iteration and I'll flip through this. So this is with the platform outside. That's an outer doors open. Next door's open. Platform slides in, but the platform could be out here repairing a satellite. We're not going to tell you what to put on that platform. Okay. Um, we've got a, uh, this is our tracked rover that we're at uh, TR level four that we've got right now. Um, that's no Ken, as you're aware, since we last presented down a few years back. And this is our next iteration of our um, double doors with a hatch. We're a bit cursory about the details of what we're doing here for obvious reasons. So you can see that the door spins open. Uh, they spin 180. Then you got the inner hatch opens. Now the design. So the, we've got Kevlar carbon fiber structure, titanium shell, ribs, and stringers on the inside here. But as you can see, the, the platform will slide in and out. Um, we've done our design, design analysis. It could be for the gateway, um, another module, or wherever you want to put the module. Um, so we've done our homework here. Complete out with sound engineering processes. It uh, could be launched on Delta or X type vehicle. This is our structural analysis of the module on the wall thicknesses. Tell me, can we have had enough of that? Looks good. All right. And we've done our thermal analysis. Pattern configuration completed with air blowing on internal equipment, laser welding, cutting 3D printing at LEO with the following design spec criteria, able to keep within this temperature range here. A geo this was the same. Okay, a little bit different here with a 28, but generally the same within the same. Additionally, the titanium shell thickness increased 
for GEO, the results still allowed the uh, manufacturer wants to operate within the equipment at temperature range of this. Okay. That's our data. Thermal radiation, and this here indicates the laser printer. So we've done our um, homework here. So the applications. So you could use it for a space hotel, material science fabrication, medical surgical unit, biological science research facility, greenhouse, fresh food, because and then satellite capture and repair, deep space gate with logistics module, Earth, Moon, lunar orbit, enhanced space capabilities beyond the existing ISS, deep space transport module for applications. So here is uh, the international docking um, installed with onto the pressurized mating adapter. And obviously I give credit for ESA and NASA, but this here is a part of the problem uh, is that you can't get anything in and out of that. <laughs> so if you need to upgrade 10, 15 years from now, you're, could, it's problematic. So this is a kind of what we're implying here. Um, so it could be taken up by the Lockheed unit but we're still going to have double doors, so you can upgrade this thing. And then this is on a, a like on the lunar surface, uh, what we envision, and you've got ease of access in here. And there's a cutaway view, a research module. This is what what you put inside the module is completely up to you, but you can see. We're still retaining the birthing docking mechanism here, so we're not getting rid of um, the standard. We're just incorporating in that standard, so you've got ease of access. Here you've got um, logistics configured for botany or greenhouse research. And obviously for surgical medical, uh, in case someone gets unwell and you've got to be able to do um, or for science, uh, and we know a physician that's collaborated with us on a paper, her name is Dr. Joyce Liao. She's involved in this area here, because obviously when you go in space, you've got um, eye problems. So, but with um, doing medical science, um, it's useful to have a module. And then, it could be that we envision this, this is a cutaway view of our logistics module reconfigured for, for habitation units, surgical, moon, Mars applications. And we've also, we've got capability of doing um, VR space for, um, you, if we were down there, we'd show you the uh, walk around inside our modules, but we've got capabilities to build other VR applications for other companies. Uh, if they contact us. So in summary, the ASMS space utility module is an innovative disruptive technology for the development of colonies. We are at TR level three on that. Utilization of a set of double doors onto a space module that will follow interior access. A novel in situ habitation module for a variety of applications such as space hotels, medical surgical units, and scientific research modules. We got a robot, a caterpillar crawler, what we've got at TR level three. Uh, ASMS has a virtual reality space field capability applications. We are at TR level six on that. Um, so we want to in, empower the space community and science. Um, and this is our references here, some of the papers we presented. And uh, obviously we're down there a few years back before COVID with um, your Ken and that. And uh, so and we're open to licensing or selling our patents and collaboration with VR. 
And that's it. And I would like to thank Ken. Is there any questions? Yes, I think James has a question. James, go ahead. I'm curious, uh, why the use of titanium rather than an aluminum alloy? I would think that would be, uh, multiply your manufacturing uh, problems. No, the reason is, is that um, aluminum can catch fire. And if you've got manufacturing, uh, it's, it can use aluminum to in <laughs> for rocket fuel, if you want. I mean, <laughs> it's just not a good idea. Um, they did have aluminium warships for lightweight, but they tend to catch fire and cause problems. And there's no fire brigade up there. So we've got triple redundancy in building our systems. And we don't want you dying. So that's why it's titanium and it's strong and you don't want to catch fire. Because if you've got a hot one with your laser, uh, laser welding, or you get a hot one fly up, it could catch light. Now, aluminium is just going to melt. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Anybody else got any questions or? Yes, Brandon, uh, go ahead. Hey again. Um, I was just curious uh, as far as the, uh, from what I understood of your presentation, the general utility of the modules themselves is uh, seems like what you're going for. Um, with regard to uh, customizable layout that it looked like you were uh, presenting, um, with the access of the double doors, is it possible to conjoin two of the modules together at the double doors, double doors to create a much larger interior space over an a longer length. Oh yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, it, it, it's like this. You can't know if you can see my hands. Well, how you put it is up to you. Okay. okay. As long as you, put, yeah, and then you can separate them. Then if you got two together, it would just open up on these two ends. But you can make a, a sausage out of it if you want, obviously. But the the the, the unique feature is that you can slide the platform in and out because my wife's not, my wife's just a nurse. She's not an engineer. And she's, that's the making a wine bottle entrance, a bottleneck. She says, if I had a house and this is a lay person, I want double doors to get furniture in and out. So, <laughs> and then, <laughs> I mean, you don't have to be an engineer to realize that building something like this and you're sending it into space for 10, 15 years, is no upgradability and no reconfigurability for a um, new iteration of a breathing apparatus. It's just, and if you've got a rover, how are you gonna get the rover in and out of a, 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 a perfect docking mechanism this this size? So yeah, so that, that's why we've been advocating because um, some of those, there's a tendency to stick with legacy equipment from the 80s and early 90s. Well, some lay people have said to me, well, that's like having a brick phone. We used to strap around, <laughs> right? You know, this, cause did it work? Yeah, do I really want to have be restricted by having a brick phone around my neck? You know, cause it worked. Um, but there's certain large entities, no name, that want to stick with brick phones because they've got it that way. So, yeah. So I hope that answered your question, um, so, Brandon. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank yeah. you very much. Um, I actually did have one other question, if that's okay. Sure. No, ask as many as you like. Okay. Um, so with regard to the platform, uh, uh, being able to move in and out of the module, uh, is there a way to secure it if, say, you wanted to, because um, I'm not sure what the uh, specific structural uh, specs would be, but would there be a way to secure it or just completely remove it to create a vertical uh, space if you needed that for some reason? Okay. So the reason we engineered it like that is obviously weight is always the enemy with right. launch systems. So if you've got a new um, thing that you want, a new piece, you can just take the platform up okay. and then, and then um, open up the doors, slide that platform out, and then slide in a new iteration of equipment, whether it's on a lunar surface. Okay, so, then, so that's good. And, and then um, with the old one, you can bring that down 
us back to earth on and then reconfigure it for the next iteration. So you get the full full circle, Brandon. So you get yeah. so you've got a new. You don't have to take the whole module up, right? That drives down the cost. The whole thing is to drive down the cost. So mm. if you can just put the equipment on the module, or sorry, on the platform, take that up, slide it in. Sorry, pull the other one out, slide this new technology on there, whatever it might be, and then pull the other one out, or leave it on a lunar surface for someone else that might want antiques roadshow stuff. <laughs> 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 so I hope that it kind of answers your question. So obviously we are not, there are already tug systems and robotic systems that can grab the robot and pull it out. That's not our job. That's already out there. Canadian arm or whatever want, what other company wants to do that, you know, so. I got you. I, I appreciate you answering both my questions, sir. All right. Do you know Richard Branson? Let's send him to us. We <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Next question. Anybody else? Um, yeah. Before anyone asks, uh, just ask uh, about the, your VR, a uh, virtual reality demo. Uh, what kind of headset is is, is needed to be uh, uh, used for the the demo? Uh, well, I've for got a demo. Samsung. I've got a Samsung phone, and then I've got the other one. But it's in the storage, quite frankly, because obviously with COVID, I don't know what it is off the top of my head, uh, Ken, but with COVID, it's not a good idea for people to be putting on um, VR right now, because obviously it's, it's not hygienic. But I, I can send you that information later, Ken. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, the our next speaker, Dennis, is going to talk about the virtual uh, reality in uh, application space. So. It's kind of interesting, you know, things are, and you are ahead of, you know, other people. You, you have been de developing this uh, as a very good uh, uh, tool to show uh, your, the concept and uh, the uh, excitement uh, for this. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so, um, well, people, we, we still have a few minutes. Uh, it, it, we have like a seven, eight minutes. So before showing your video, uh, and, and then how, how, how do you think for, for your platform, how many uh, module you think uh, uh, would be more economic to be launched at the same time? For example, Starlink, you can launch multiple satellites at the same time. But for you, can you, uh, is uh, the size or some of those things, can, uh, how many can be fit into a ferry? Uh, uh, and uh, how, uh, how do you think uh, if multiple launch uh, in, in one launch, I mean, multiple module in one launch will save the cost? Yeah, that, that's why, Ken, you send one module up and then um, you then, that's because we create, the key is flexibility. So then you send that one module up and then you have to send another. But because the platform can be slid in and out, Ken, later, you've, you, it's, there's an old saying, there's a the billionaire, says, can you build me the fastest car in the world? And the engineers turn around and say, yeah, not a problem. How much money you want to spend? So <laughs> with this, it's it, anything can be done, but it, it's it's like, how, how much money do they want to spend? It, it's just, so I, and, the, and the modules can be X size, but obviously the range has to be some human factors, aspect ratios in there. So, yeah, I, I'd say just one at a time right now. Okay, Ken. I see, I see, I yeah. see. Uh, and one, one thing is that uh, when you launch, do you picture that uh, the passenger will be launched inside the module or is it separate? Separate, Ken. They would have to sit in the lower part of the, in, in a normal... Um, like a dragon, in, those things. Yeah, in a normal okay. position. Yeah, because they want in case they get thumped around in there. That that won't be good. Yeah. So, I see. I see. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, we still have five minutes. Uh, anybody has any question? Uh, if you want me to go back to another uh, PowerPoint, or um, if you can show them the video, Ken, okay. and then we uh, can swing back. Um, yeah. Okay. Ken's got my video because of the data. It's easier to if it's in situ down there. All right, can you play him the video and um, okay? Yeah, go ahead.
Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it, Ken. Okay, Make sure yes, you can. Starting now. Yes. You got the volume on it, Ken? Uh, you, do, you don't see it? It's playing now. Oh, I can't hear oh, the yeah. sound. Yeah, I pause think you need sound. to share sound. Okay, let, one second. Let me pause it. The sound. Um, actually, I didn't see, didn't hear the sound, though. Let me see. Even when I was playing it, I didn't hear the sound. It might, it's all it is, is space music. Um, so you can imagine that in your head if you have trouble. Ken. Uh, just give me one second because all right i see let me see let me try it again uh share sound the share sound is is enabled uh let me see But there is no sound from even my end, though. Well, I'm going to put space music on this then, if you want. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah. go ahead. Just you have to sort of uh, whistle some space music. <laughs> OK. Let me see. Let me see. If, while you are seeing this, I'm testing on the other on the, the other way. Uh, so I've described that, as you can see, the rover that we've got a TR level four would come out like a geologist doing a sample and then bring it back into the um, in, back into the module and it's controlled by the astronaut inside. There you go, Ken. All right, you've got, you've got the music now. Okay. Oh, you hear the music? Yeah. Cool. So that's the laser welder uh, that the rover would do. Um, it, it, I don't know if you remember erector sets, but that's kind of what we're implying here, because they're the basic building blocks. Okay. Um, any other questions? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think the music is is um, for the later part of the video. Oh, I, I don't. It must be uh, Lansing, like it's delayed or something. But it does start right from the beginning. I don't know quite what's. Hmm. Yeah, but it does start right from the beginning. Anyway, on my end. Okay. 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 Uh, so, any other questions I can answer? Yeah, RP, I saw you uh, type something. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Mr. Humphreys for such a great presentation. I think nowadays VR is so much on the cutting edge. Um, we had a science fair recently in our area, and a lot of the children who came, they were so um, drawn to the technology, especially with Mars and all of the media out here in LA that really glorifies it. And so I think uh, your presentation really helps put it in perspective that, you know, there's so much we can simulate here to help us get ready for what the future holds. I really thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the whole team down there and the uh, Las, LA and Las Vegas for uh, allowing me to present again. 
Um, I'm sorry I couldn't bring my uh, all my VR paraphernalia, but that has to be in situ. So, um, but we are open for business. If uh, we've got a good team, I've got structural, we got a thermal, I got a mechanical engineer. Most, all of them are at masters level, um, and we're willing and able to do subcontracting work for a large entity or um, we're open for business. So, um, I see we've got to build that track rover. Um, in uh, the garage, you could say, and they are at TR level four on that. Um, so we're ready and willing um, for as a sub. So there we are. Thank you very much for your time and thank you for the time, Ken. Any other questions? <clears throat> Hello? Hello? Yes, I, I'm trying to see if I can play the video. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> because uh, I think it's the prayer. It, uh, the prayer seems to be okay if, if I use the right one. Mm -hmm. Can you hear this? Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Okay, so let's play this again. Okay. Ah, there you go. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. This Good. is amazing. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah hopefully, uh, uh, see you uh, uh, more uh, more your presentation soon. Yeah. Um, I hope um, the track rover was a little bit of surprise for you, uh, Ken. We didn't have that last time. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You see, it is. Yeah. All right. Any other questions before I go? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies. Have a safe day. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye. Okay, so, thank you. yeah, thank you, Peter. Stay in touch. Yeah, I will. God bless you all. Yeah. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Okay, so our next speaker, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, let me see, is, uh, is uh, going to tell us more excitement about this uh, uh, virtual reality uh, in aerospace. Of course, um, you know, for Peter's talk, it's, it's not just, uh, it's more on the manufacturing, but he utilized um, this uh, virtual reality for his uh, de demonstration. Um, but Dennis will tell us more about uh, maybe more aspect for this. Uh, so let me see. All right. So Dennis is actually, uh, is a, Oh, sorry, I, I kind of cut, cut it paste. So he's actually the uh, founding partner of uh, Daibashi Consulting. He's formerly with North Grumman Space Division, uh, formerly with the NASA Dryden Research Center uh, Hypersonic uh, Vehicle Division. Uh, Mr. Lin is, a, um, is, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, his consulting is 
uh, assisting private ventures, government organization, and higher learning foundations uh, with, with top to bottom technical expertise in space-based product. Uh, before founding Daibashi Consulting, Dennis was North Grumman Space Division uh, lead uh, innovative engineering strategist and was responsible for developing and constructing a modernized product facility, uh, including advanced manufacturing technology. I mean, that's a similar topic, same topic uh, uh, Peter was talking about, such as robotics, digital uh, signage, data consolidation, augment, and the virtual reality systems. He also spent over 15 years in senior management roles in many satellite programs, including one of few lunar missions in the last decade. Prior to joining Northrop Grumman, Dennis was with NASA's Dryden Research Center, working on hypersonic vehicles and was responsible for testing and operation of fly line activities. Previously to his work at NASA, Dennis was a government liaison contractor with U US Navy involved with their submarine-based missile systems. In addition to being a passionate engineer, Dennis is an advocate for, of educating the generation of engineers uh, through outreach events at university and the various other learning institute, institutions. Uh, his topic today is virtual reality in space application. So welcome, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, highly appreciate. Uh, it's all Thank yours. You Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak at this event. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so what a great segue into my topic here on virtual and augmented reality in aerospace. Um, I know a lot of people are familiar with um, this kind of technology in the retail and gaming world. Um, probably more in a gaming world than in retail, but it's starting to make its uh, headway into the um, production, manufacturing, and engineering uh, world, as you can see. Uh, why is it an important next step for corporations to really use this kind of technology? Uh, there's really three main things that every company is really looking for. How do we build this faster? How do we build our product faster? How do we reduce our cost? And how do we maintain our quality? Those are the three major things that every company is still trying to maintain. And what everybody really does is they concentrate on what they currently do. How do we streamline the paperwork? Uh, how do we cut people's cost? I mean, cut costs by reducing the number of heads. Um, there's very few, maybe minute pieces of technology insertion. Um, it could very well be based on a, a cultural aspect of this is not how we usually do it. So people generally don't look at outside technologies that's perhaps used in other industries to apply into the aerospace world to really help them achieve these three main goals that these corporations are really going for. Now, there are supplemental considerations uh, when we use these kind of technologies, such as the customer experience. Um, a lot of these VR and AR uh, experiences uh, really leave a lasting impression, especially on both the customer and the employee who is actually using it to design these products. Um, so I want you people to, I want everybody on this, uh, you know, uh, this presentation really remember these um, items as we keep going here. Corporations should definitely have an AR VR strategy. Um, there's so much data out there right now that guides every decision that we do that it's really limiting us by trapping us in a, in a two dimensional world. And we really need to take advantage of all of this data that's being collected on a daily basis. Uh, we need a new fundamental shift of how information is presented. If you really look at over the last 20 to 30 years, um, we went from paper to PowerPoint slides. And in the 20 to 30 year gap since PowerPoint came about, there really hasn't been really any change in terms of how we utilize that information and present it. So I'm looking at AR, VR as really that new way to do that. Before we go into some of the use cases, I want everybody to really take a look at 
um, this slide here. Uh, what is the power of an image? Most everything that we look at and we experience in our daily lives is visual. More than 90% of the information that our brain perceives is visual. And you can look on this left-hand side right here. Our brains can process visual images 60,000 times faster than we can reading text. So let that sink in a, a bit, 60,000 times faster. So if we're talking about efficiency and getting an idea across, 60,000 times faster than writing something down, okay? And you can see at the bottom too, the retention rate of the amount of information that you see is much better from a visual standpoint than any other form of communication. Technology insertions nowadays, we have to think about um, as a overall strategy. Um, and these using this to AR VR technology, um, using the image that it provides and incorporating it into an overall strategy with how a company could potentially use this technology will be very powerful for them. And you'll see that in the use cases uh, in the next slide. So this is kind of a general overview of some of the use cases of how a typical aerospace uh, defense company um, manages this program. You have your evalu studies, evaluations, proposals, design, production integration and test, and launch and sustainment. In each one of these areas, uh, AR and VR applications um, could be extremely beneficial. And we'll go through uh, a few of those uh, uh, use cases in the next few slides. But for example, uh, when you're looking in the proposal world, um, you're trying to convince a customer uh, that you're the proper company to, to go with. Um, you're trying to build a high-tech product for them, and you're trying to show them that you have the flexibility and the technology to do it. Well, if we continue to stay on paper and showing them on paper, it's just not going to really give them that extra image um, that you are actually capable of doing what they're looking for. So let's go through some of the more uh, detailed use cases uh, for augmented and virtual reality. You can see on the left-hand side, we have the traditional engineering and how it can be enhanced in an AR VR world. So let's take proposals, for example, like we were talking about before. Um, most of the time when we do proposals, there's a lot of limitations that's provide, that's um, put onto the company. Uh, for example, there's limits to how many pages that can be written, uh, how many word count can be done for each section. So imagine you're trying to explain to the customer what your subsystem does, and you're limited to one page and perhaps 3,000 words. Now that's gonna be a big problem. And that's historically been a problem of what do we cut out? What do we leave in? And does that actually provide the kind of image and information that the customer is looking for? Now, if you insert augmented and virtual reality systems in there, which some companies have started doing, that limit no longer exists. You can cram a lot more information into a visual proposal than you could ever do writing down on a piece of paper. The added benefit in today's world right now is that the customer doesn't quite know how to handle augmented and virtual reality system and actually place limits on it. So it's really a free for all at this point in time in terms of what kind of information you can put in there and how you can uh, sway the customer's uh, image uh, toward your company. So that's one of the biggest uh, portions for proposal world, uh, design reviews. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have been part of design, uh, design reviews where an engineer or a manager goes up in front of everybody and they have 85 slides to present on one topic. Each slide has different views of a particular part of the hardware and it's left 
up to the audience to mentally remember and spatially remember where each of those parts are and how they connect to each other. So what exactly are you doing? You're taking the mental capacity away from the audience to actually listen to the presenter and really making them think and trying to visualize the hardware itself. If you use an augmented and virtual reality system, you can reduce that slide count significantly. Uh, we've done a lot of proof of concepts on this where I've actually had my interns uh, develop uh, a, 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 uh, a uh, experience um, that had the full uh, satellite system in there and they've created one where you can walk through it. We can explode out every single part. We can walk through it. We can talk about each nut, bolt, washer, cable, harness, whatever piece of hardware you want to. And when we explain it that way and we show it to people, they absolutely get that idea significantly faster than if we were to show them on PowerPoint slides. So this goes back to being able to process information 60,000 times faster than you would by reading a text. In addition to that, it leaves a lasting impression on the audience on what you're capable of. And now they really quickly understand what it is you're trying to do. And they're listening more to the message than really trying to piece together all the different slides together in their head. In addition to the design reviews, uh, we transition into production. So design review and production kind of go hand in hand together. Um, there's, a, there's a small window where they kind of work overlapping. So when we get into production, there is going to be countless number of paper drawings and physical models. Everything that we do in an engineering world currently today, every piece of paper, every drawing, every sheet of a drawing costs a certain amount of money to produce and maintain. Physical models, extremely expensive, extremely time consuming to build and maintain. So when you put yourself in an augmented and virtual reality world, you can really reduce the number of drawing packages. And you can kind of see some of that happen over the last 10 years. Um, when we moved away from paper drawings and really started to give the technicians or the engineers on the floor the ability to look at the drawings, let's say in CATIA or Pro-E, and they're able to rotate um, the drawings in a computer environment you know, in a 3D world. But what you're lacking is you're lacking a spatial reference to the actual hardware. So there is still a link that the technician and engineer has to do in their mind to connect what they see on the screen to the hardware itself. And what we've done is we've created a proof of concept uh, where we've used uh, two separate, uh, well, we've actually used the HoloLens and we actually created um, an experience where we overlaid virtual information right onto physical hardware onto a one-to-one -one scale. So a user can put on their uh, headset, um, turn it on, and our information is layered right on top of the physical hardware where we can superimpose real uh, virtual data such as where hardware should be. Um, information in terms of how you build this hardware, videos, reference stocks, so on and so forth. So all of this information now is with the user right in front, overlaid right on top of the hardware. So now that eliminates a lot of these links that a person would mentally have to make. From a physical model standpoint, we build a lot of these physical models for accessibility studies. And some of these physical models could be hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. We do that to buy down our risk. We do that to make sure that we don't run into additional problems down the line during production. And as I said before, these are very, very expensive and time consuming things to do. Now, if we built a real detailed virtual reality and or augmented reality system where people can go in and really see 
what the hardware is and actually do those accessibility studies without building the hardware, that's going to be a win for pretty much all parties. These uh, physical models will also, you have a problem of maintaining it. When you're done, where do you store it? All this kind of stuff adds up to cost and adds up to space. The virtual reality system, it's already done by the designer. It's a matter of taking that information and rendering it into an AR and VR world. And I'll speak a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. Logistics. Um, in a logistics standpoint, one of the biggest and most expensive things that we do is what we call trailblazer activities and which is essentially fit checks to make sure that what we plan to do will either fit under a bridge, fit inside a truck, fit inside of a plane, et cetera, et cetera. I'll give you an example. Um, sometimes when we do fit checks uh, for a space satellite system that goes um, on an airplane transport, uh, we would fly out a C-5 military transport, which is quite expensive. It's a million dollars round trip flight. So we would schedule and pay for a million dollar round trip flight just to check to see if a container fits inside of it. We already have the dimensions of the plane. We know everything about the plane. We know everything about the opening. Again, you can use this AR VR environment to really do trial and errors as many times as you want, and you can reduce your cost. Now this kind of goes into the next one, which is the training. Um, the training currently in an aerospace environment is, is not really the best. Um, most of what everybody does is read some documents and uh, let me place you with somebody and learn from them. It's really just shadowing somebody. So a lot of retail companies recently, for example, like Walmart has purchased quite a number of uh, virtual reality headsets for employee training. Now, this is Walmart. Now, just think about that. Walmart is investing heavily into augmented and virtual reality system, along with a lot of other retail companies. So what aerospace companies can really benefit from this is having their technicians, you, although you don't have the real hardware, you can create that similar hardware in a virtual environment so that they can actually practice on it so that they can get familiar with it, so that they can get comfortable with it. And I'll give you an example from a training perspective. Imagine you have these technicians, although they're very well experienced, a lot of what we build in the aerospace world, in the, at least in the very beginning, is one of a kind. No one's ever seen it before, no one's ever done it before. We'll take, for example, James Webb. Uh, very unique, one of a kind um, space product. Um, costing multi-billion dollars, but when we have big operations, the first time we ever do it is actually working with the real flight hardware besides sitting down at a table and going through procedures and pictures. Now, let me make the comparison here. Would you ever get on a plane if the pilot has never gone through a flight simulation? And it's no different here. Why would we want to have our technicians and our engineers uh, not have the capability to run as lifelike scenarios and training scenarios in an augmented or a virtual reality world before actually touching the real hardware? Now, there's a side benefit to this as well. If we can show that the customer comes in and says, okay, are you ready to do this expensive and critical operation, we can sit there and say, yes, we have. All of our technicians, our engineers, our managers, we've gone through hundreds of hours of simulations and we believe we're ready. That becomes a confidence booster to the customer and that only bolsters the company's image in terms of, yes, we are capable and we are ready to do this with minimal risk. So that goes also to the next one, which is customer experience right now. Everything that's being shown to the customer is really just static, non-interactive information. 
um, PowerPoint slides, reports, and so on and so forth. Um, the, the experiences that we've developed uh, for the customer that we've shown them, you can see the eyes light up. Um, they understand the power of what this uh, new technology can bring in the aerospace world. And they're really looking at how we can incorporate this in. Now, everybody's heard of the next, uh, the sixth generation fighter and how it was um, developed so quickly uh, because of quote unquote digital twinning uh, systems. For those who are unfamiliar with that, that's essentially creating an identical uh, vehicle in a virtual world with data. Um, virtual and augmented reality would just be another subset of that. So now, your status and your presentation can be interactive, it can be remote, and it can be real time with actual hardware. For example, if you're back in Washington, DC, giving your customer at say Goddard Space Center, a presentation of how well James Webb is doing, um, that person over there could be speaking to the customer with a live link back here to our factory to a factory here at Northrop Grumman and a person with an augmented reality headset providing additional information more than what a camera can see. Now that is going to provide a next level of understanding to the audience. Uh, and also it will provide um, less work for the presenter to do and they can actually concentrate on presenting the message versus creating the PowerPoint presentation. And the same thing goes with the employee experience. Um, most of uh, the last couple of years um, when I've done a lot of outreach to universities um, and even talked to some of the newer and younger engineers and up and coming, uh, there's a there's a quite a disconnect in terms of understanding and the the view of aerospace companies. The aerospace companies are generally viewed as old and stodgy compared to, you know, the um, other tech companies like Apple and so on and so forth. But when they start seeing that we're actually using these kind of technologies, augmented virtual reality and so on and so forth in all of the aspects of how we build a spacecraft, they start to change the way that they think about us. Um, they start to get more excited in terms of what we're doing, how we're doing it, how can they insert themselves here. I give you an example um, of this as well. I had a new employee um, come in at one time and we were still using pagers. And I'm sure probably half of you know what pages are, another half does not. <laughs> but I asked this person, go ahead and page, uh, page somebody that they need to talk to. And that, that engineer looked at me like, what is a pager and how do you use it? So in today's world, all of these new engineers that's coming up, they're going to understand the new technologies that's, that they use in their everyday life, which is, you know, iPads, augmented virtual reality systems, all of these things that technically traditionally do not exist in an aerospace company's um, culture and environment. So you don't necessarily want to be teaching the new engineers antiquated and old technology. You really want them to learn the new stuff. And it's also going to help with retention and really their view on, on the company itself. Okay. Now, there are a couple of things to that stands in our way for mass adoption in aerospace. One of the major ones is going to be cybersecurity. Um, we did a lot of uh, talking with customers and, and a lot of security people in terms of how exactly can augmented and virtual reality systems work in, in our environment. Um, because most of what we do um, has a lot of security um, attached to it, these systems are camera-based, Wi-Fi. Bluetooth, as soon as they hear all of these technologies, their brains automatically just shut down. 
So we've been spending a lot of time talking with them, explaining to them, showing them um, what exactly these systems are. So you, as you can see, a lot of the people out there in our aerospace world doesn't quite understand how this how this technology works. They understand what it is, but they're not quite yet familiar with how does it work? How does it fit in to the current security world? So that's going to be a major hurdle that pretty much every aerospace company is going to have to deal with. Now, it's not impossible. We have made headways with both the customer and um, security personnel that uh, certain things could and potentially can be allowed. Uh, it just needs to be vetted uh, more. And this is just a nascent beginning for this technology in aerospace. The next one is gonna be securing data. How do we secure that data? A lot of this data is going to be transferred via Wi-Fi. Now it depends on the kind of system that you use. Um, certain systems, um, like uh, for example, we use the Meta headset. This is not the Facebook Meta. This used to be a smaller company um, where they were uh, tethered to a desktop computer. Um, others, such as the HoloLens, does not require that. The computer is on the headset itself and information is transferred via Wi-Fi. So it really depends on the kind of system that you use and how it's going to be used and where it's going to be used. And that would really determine how the cybersecurity portion is going to be handled. Now, the next one is going to be the antiquated infrastructure. Um, this goes back to a lot of aerospace corporations uh, have not traditionally spent um, a lot of money um, upgrading their facilities. Um, and rightfully so, because over the last 20 or 30 years, there really hasn't been a need. But there's been a lot of change in terms of the, the culture and the views uh, of the government, such as there's no longer um, free money uh, being floated around. So now companies will have to find a better way, more cost efficient way to do things. So that means now integrating technology uh, into their everyday work life. And that leads to looking at their current infrastructure. Do I have enough Wi-Fi bandwidth? These augmented and virtual reality systems use a lot of bandwidth, um, especially if you have hundreds of systems being used uh, at any one time. So that is definitely a consideration for companies to really think about uh, their infrastructure. Um, the next being data storage capacity. Um, everybody is familiar with the term, um, uh, what they call it, uh, Iron Mountain, right? Where you, where we store all of our paper documentation. Well, now we have to find a new way to store all of our uh, virtual reality systems. And, and we'll talk about that in the next one, which is the data conversion. And then this is really goes back to your Wi-Fi, your bandwidth and your infrastructure is what is the latency? What is the data input lag? Uh, am I gonna see uh, the information smoothly or is it going to cut out? Um, a lot of this really goes back to the user's um, experience. Is it worth it for them to even use this uh, system uh, if the infrastructure cannot handle it? So that's going to be a, a quite a big hurdle, and it will be a bit of an ex expensive one, which is why uh, it, when I was at Northrop Grumman, when we built that new facility, we made sure to upgrade our infrastructure to be able to handle all of these new technologies that's coming in. Now, the next one that's going to be quite a big hurdle to the mass adoption um, of this technology is the data conversion. Now there's a lot of data out there right now that's in either some design software, CATIA, ProE, um, whichever system the company is using. How do we convert that existing data without having to recreate it? Recreating it is time and money and that's probably going to be a, a non-starter for most companies. 
So there are a few companies out there that I've uh, had some experience with where they're actually looking at um, working with uh, aerospace companies to seamlessly convert their engineering models into an into AR VR data that can be used in multiple headsets. So they're looking at being hardware agnostic. Um, they can convert the data into whatever system that you need it to be. Um, they're, they're making some headways. They're not quite there yet. Uh, I'll give you an example. We contacted this one company to come down. They said that they were able to convert um, engineering model within a few minutes and put it into a VR environment. So we had them come down and show us um, how they could do that. They brought their laptop. I gave them a, a USB stick with a slim, sl uh, slim down engineering model in it. And they did convert it within a few minutes. Now, how would they do with a fully um, populated engineering model that has an enormous amount of data that I don't know, but there are people out there trying to solve that issue right now. And then one of the big things, at least from a customer perspective and also from a quality perspective is what is the data accountability? Um, how do we maintain the data? Uh, because if we're in this environment, people can make changes. Uh, in it, how do we make sure that we can maintain that revision? And how do we make sure that we don't lose track of it? Now, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, but each company uh, in the aerospace world that will be using this will have to look at how they currently do things and really come up with a way to maintain that accountability. Because uh, when you're changing things in a drawing, and you're changing things on paper, it's easy to have somebody sign off and so on and so forth. But if you're, if you have five people in a virtual world and each one is making changes, even if you're in the same environment at the same time, you do have to keep track of what's going on before your design just, you know, you start to lose all control of it. So that's going to be one of the major, um, uh, considerations for, for corporations. Now, the last one, which is going to be quite a large hurdle in itself is the culture. Um, I spoke a little bit about the culture, the newer engineers coming in by all means understands this, um, is excited about it. Um, the people who are there been there for the last 20 or 30 years, that one will probably require a little bit of, of uh, discussion and convincing to use. Um, and then of course, you've got your corporate management where we have to make it at least uh, a nice return on investment for them, uh, for them to even consider this. So, so there's a number of different things that is, uh, going to be obstacles to a mass adoption, but uh, we are making headway in each one of these. Uh, and it's not impossible. Uh, it seems impossible probably 10 years ago or five years ago, but now it seems more readily uh, available, the technology, so people understand it a lot more. So then they become more comfortable with it. So that is pretty much my whole presentation. Now, I did have some videos, but I was afraid that it would probably, um, you know, take up too much bandwidth. So I could present that at your May 14th event, Ken, but I don't actually have it here right now to to show you. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the May 14th, uh, uh, you, you're highly welcome to to show the, the wonderful video you have. Perfect. Yeah, those those videos um, showed some of the the different scenarios that we had where um, if a designer were to use, for example, the meta headset that that we bought, um, you're sitting in front of a computer, the engineer pulls up the the uh, augmented reality 
um, uh, spacecraft right in front of her. She can choose which one she wants, which part. She can grab it with her hands, pull it apart. The parts explode out. And so now you can walk through every single part that was in that piece that she pulled out. So a lot of the hardware that, that we've been using um, doesn't really require controllers, um, such as the Meta, the HoloLens, um, really uses your hand gestures. Uh, we also had another one where we had the HoloLens, where we did a one-to-one -one projection of uh, ex, uh, virtual information right onto a Class C satellite, a small sat, where we can open panels virtually. Uh, we can see what was inside. We can show technicians what to, to uh, install, uh, what to stay away from. They can click on something and show a video of how to do it. So there's so much information that can be shown on there. And it's a one-to-one -one scale, so it helps with the spatial reference for whoever is actually using that system. So I'll, I'll show all of that in your May 14th event upcoming. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's uh, actually better. Yeah, in, in an in-person event uh, with, with demo video, that's actually much better. You are right. Bandwidth issue, <laughs> exactly. So that was my presentation. So is there any questions? Uh, yes, folks, if you have any question, please click raise hand. Or you can just speak out if you, oh, Brandon, go ahead. Brandon, you are enabled for your mic. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for letting me speak again. Um, so I was curious as to whether or not the... Uh, uh, from your presentation, I gather that there's a lot been going into like uh, not only the training, but also the practical application for usage in, in uh, 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 design phases, uh, like you were talking about with the one-to-one uh, -one overlay and such. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious as to whether or not there has been any uh, research or just uh, data gathered in regards to potentially using it for um, – how can I put this? Uh, mm, psychological aid um so for instance like uh, usage in long-term space missions or anything where you know if uh, assuming there isn't a way to just uh put people in an extended sleep of some sort you know sci-fi ish or whatever you want to call it um you know uh, i know a concern that has been talked about is the uh loss of uh, time as a uh, you know, regular sleeping cycles and such, and just the mental strain of being in space on a journey that long to uh, other planets and other things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, has there been any uh, research done into like the usage of like VR or AR to alleviate those circumstances? Um, so there, there are, uh, but that's more, uh, I would say, a, a immature uh, case scenario right now. Um, because, you know, we are not necessarily technologically ready yet for deep, deep space missions. So there okay. hasn't been that many people looking into that kind of a case scenario. But there are a lot of um, studies and research done out there um, that using uh, this kind of technology um, helps people from a psychological standpoint. So it definitely does have applications from a long-term, uh, you know, space mission. And, okay. and you can, you can read that out there on, you know, like nursing homes and so on and so forth, that it really does help how people perceive and change the way that they think. And you can even see that from the engineers and the customers who actually use that now in the aerospace world. Oh, interesting. Um, I guess I would also leave you then to this question, which uh, would be more into uh, what your presentation was mostly based on, which is uh, the, uh, I guess, industry usage. Mm -hmm. um, do you think it is uh, possible to, in the same way that, uh, uh, in the same way that they have like, uh, like for medical usage, uh, they have uh, essentially like remote uh, surgery uh, mm -hmm. robotics. Uh, do you think it would be possible at some point to utilize this type of technology in the industry to allow someone who has a specific expertise in uh, either 
a physical craft of some sort or like uh or just some some field that is necessary for a mission to uh be able to do things remotely like oh for instance uh to have maybe somebody who is not uh as qualified to be an astronaut but yeah. is qualified to be a technical member of a team uh be able to do so remotely instead of being on site absolutely um there's actually two two cases um one uh was actually done already uh, up at the international space station they actually sent up some hollow lenses and that was a almost a test case where the astronaut would use the hollow lens um, to potentially repair something they with uh direction from an engineer and or technical team you know on the plan so that's actually been tried out um, another case scenario that um, that I actually had developed with my interns um, was to develop a, a uh, application in the augmented and virtual reality world where as a say quality personnel could be in another building and then that person could be monitoring four or five different operations happening at the same time doesn't have to be in the same building but they can be witnessing the operation and providing their services without having to be there. So uh, that helps from an efficiency standpoint. Uh, but yes, that remote um, portion of it is one of the major reasons that we started using this. Um, actually, we did a third one where we sent technicians uh, with this uh, hardware to a remote location and their managers and or engineers were back on site and they were reviewing and watching real time what they were doing and providing any kind of technical support as you go real time. So that has been um, done and that is probably a, a pretty mature portion uh, of this AR VR technology. It's very similar to what, you know, that we're used to, which is FaceTime right except right, now you're able to project even more information hmm. so given that um uh, uh, do you mind if i ask another question sure, absolutely okay uh given that do you think it might open up the field of uh and maybe not in the immediate future of course but uh it start opening up the field of uh say the space-based uh, employment to people who are maybe not as technically proficient because they can have uh, this uh, oversight of someone who is extremely technically qualified for various tasks, like for instance, like you're saying, like uh, doing monitoring multiple tasks in a certain space, like uh, potentially could that uh, open up the space for uh, less technically proficient people to be directed by someone else? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Um... We're doing that now in a very, very limited um, standpoint. We're, the way we currently do it right now is via phone, <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> of from, course. you know, from a AR VR standpoint, is very antiquated. But absolutely, um, that is one of the major uh, applications of this technology that actually a number of companies um, are trying to do where they're creating a environment where people can see what the other person's doing, provide real time technical expertise uh, with each party being at either different parts of the country or, you know, like you said, potentially off the planet. So that technology uh, exists already in the augmented and virtual reality world. It's just a matter of creating the software to really meet the need of what your use case is so the hardware exists it's just a matter of software at this time mm, okay right. interesting thank you sure is there are any other questions uh yeah dennis uh yeah uh dennis i think this is uh because our next speaker joe is here okay uh so i i think uh yeah we actually uh, made up uh some of the time that got delayed initially um uh, uh, but I think we, we can direct more questions for uh, uh, for you to uh, May 14, okay. uh, so they can join us and more fun. Uh, so folks, you know, uh, uh, please join us on May 14, and uh, Dennis will be there, Manhattan Beach Library in person. Of course, you can also attend online, but uh, as Dennis pointed out, the bandwidth 
uh, Wi-Fi thing is better if you can live better in person. And we actually started uh, uh, as also for the wide, young professional, early career professional networking. Uh, but it, it, as Dennis said, this topic is uh, you know exciting to 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 everyone to experience. Uh, a senior, we have senior members excited about this, and uh, you know, Buzz Aldrin, you know, is also very excited about this, and uh, we have a K twelve student as uh, RP uh, also mentioned. Uh, so May fourteen, please uh, join us, and uh, Dennis will be there, and uh, uh, we'll have more fun. All right, thank, thank you, you very much, Ken. Thank you, Dennis. This is fantastic. So exciting. Definitely wonderful, um, uh, you know, uh, activity for new space. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, so our next speaker, Joe uh, from Mason System, is here. Uh, I, I think that uh, he because he he probably for work schedule, so that's why we try to uh, catch you a little bit. Uh, but first of all, you can see here in this slide, lower left, you can see May 14. Uh, the check-in start 12:30. Uh, if you order dinner, lunch box, uh, enjoy lunch, and uh, the Dennis will start at the, uh, uh, I mean, the, the event will start at 1.20 with introduction, and uh, he will uh, do a, a, a briefing at 1.30, then we'll have demo, and uh, we'll have a, a few, uh, the, you know, and uh, people come here, bring their own VR and the orchestra on the audio uh, video, uh, everybody have fun. Uh, we'll have uh, a very exciting, uh, fun stuff that day and uh, with, with Dennis. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, our next speaker, Joe, is uh, it's a, a electrical engineering, a, a, a electrical engineer from uh, a, a Mason Space System. is the lead avionics engineer for uh, Zakdor. If I hopefully I pronounce um, pronounce it properly, uh, and Mr. Pereira is an electrical engineer at uh, there in Mason, and uh, he operates as the lead uh, avionics engineer for uh, this exciting project. Uh, Mason is a Mason sixth generation, well, also sixth generation, like a stealth fighter. Okay, uh, mm -hmm. vertical takeoff and a vertical landing vehicle. Joe also has experience designing and uh, integrating automated test equipment for uh, production avionics used in Air Force uh, high altitude mm -hmm. ISR drones and the fighter jets. He received a bachelor in physics from Washington and uh, Washington and Lee University and a master's in aerospace engineering from University of Maryland. So his topic today is uh, Zakdor, a new rocket powered vehicle to fill the space test bed gap. Okay, so uh, let's welcome Joe, uh, it's all yours. Thank you so much. All right, thanks for the introduction, Ken. Can everybody hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. All right, I'm sharing my screen. And we will present. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. I'm Joe Perella, and as Ken said, I'm an electrical engineer for Maston Space Systems, and I'm currently operating as the lead avionics engineer for our new vertical takeoff and vertical landing vehicle, which aims to fill the test bed gap. Um, so first, a little background on the company, if you're not already familiar with us. We're a space infrastructure company that's focused on enabling sustainable access and utilization of our solar system. Um, and we wanna start with the moon, but we've been building and flying reusable rockets for over 18 years. We had the company's 18th birthday yesterday. Um, and we were one of the first commercial companies to develop the reusable vertical takeoff and vertical landing vehicles. And since our initial development, we've had over 600 successful rocket powered landings. So now we're going to be applying some of our terrestrial flight experience to lunar missions as well. So we've been selected as a part of the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. Um, so our first mission to the moon uh, with, with more insight. Um, but we do more than just building rockets. We do a lot of technology development as well. So what we're trying to do is solve some of the pre most pressing needs in space exploration. Um, so some of these top technologies we really view as keystones that can enable that sort of sustainable level of access um, that we're shooting for. So a couple examples here include a warming system that allows vehicles to survive the lunar night. There's an instant landing pad system that mitigates lunar dust during landing operations. Um, we've also developed a rocket mining system that allows us to extract lunar ice and do some in situ resource utilization. Um, 
So a lot of keystone technology developments happening other than just rockets. But obviously our rocket test bed is what we're known for uh, the most. So we use it to test and iterate space technologies on earth so that by the time they reach their destination, um, they've been flight proven. So we'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly after, but the last highlight here is our lunar delivery. So we can provide an end-to-end -end lunar delivery services and our Zeline lander is uh, currently in development for our first lunar mission. Um, we've got a couple other larger landers in development that will be able to accommodate more payloads and more complex missions. So really excited for what's on the horizon for Mastin. But to get a little more in depth into the actual rocket testbed um, and some more context on that, we operate as one of the only independent test beds. Um, and what we do is help validate new space technologies on our terrestrial vehicles. So we work directly with commercial customers in addition to companies that go through NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. Um, and you can think of our terrestrial test bed as an e extension to the lab. We wanna provide a scenario for our customers where they can get real truth flight data that you can't really get any other way. Um, so some, some really cool examples here that we've worked on with legacy programs, there's the JPL lander vision system, system that we tested uh, and that helped enable the successful Mars 2020 landing of Perseverance. We've also tested some sample collection systems you could see in the middle there um, and camera deployment systems. So we can really pair with a very broad a uh, range of organizations from commercial to government to university um, and, and provide the test capabilities that you need for your hardware. So this is our uh, list of legacy rockets. Uh, the first that we've developed was Zombie um, and that tested the JPL lander vision system for the Perseverance landing. Um, but our current, current primary use vehicle is uh, Zodiac, which has been active since 2015 and has over 100 successful flights on that individual platform. So we've gone through many iterations you can see here uh, at a very high success rate. And we can even uh, specialize in providing things like multiple flights in a single day. You can see we've achieved uh, up to single flights in one day on a legacy system. So we're really there to get you your data early and often. So we can start to work with our payload developers as early as 12 months before our actual flights take place. And we provide technical specs on the vehicle and develop a concept of operations um, in conjunction with the customer in order to meet our customer's objectives and success metrics, whatever they may be. Um, so we work with the developers, again, as an extension of our own team because that really ensures a successful integration onto our vehicle. And once we've completed integration and verified objectives, we go into closed loop tethered uh, flights. You can see in the middle there, it's tethered to the crane. It allows us to get data, iterate on the initial setup and eventually uh, advance to the open loop free flights. Um, so we can really iterate quickly and, and work to customize each test campaign based on the customer's objective. Um, so, where does Zogdor really fit into the equation here? Um, and the aim is to essentially fill a gap of higher, faster, and stronger um, that we haven't achieved before. So there's, there's really this growing number of missions to the moon, Mars, beyond. And these technologies all require a more advanced and a more robust testing platform that allows the customer to reduce risks and ensure their mission success. So we're gonna solve that by providing our state-of-the-art testing analog, uh, which is Zogdor. It's the terrestrial analog to your lunar and Martian missions. And that will provide the test capability that exceed current vehicles. Um, so they're used to test and mature critical space technologies. We wanna help companies go from breadboards and ideas in the brain and prototype hardware move from those low technology readiness levels and up towards the higher levels where they can say it's been flight proven um, and it's ready for a mission. So there's a couple of key benefits that, that help us achieve that. 
Um, the first is that we're capable of flying at higher altitudes and faster speeds, so suborbital spaceflight, but we will also carry the mast and hypervisor that allows us to transfer control of the vehicle um, to our customer. So the mast and hypervisor is essentially a virtual sandbox, and we allow the payload to operate inside of the, of the sandbox, supply commands, um, you know, make the instrument and sensor readings that the payload needs, but then also allow them to control the vehicle, you know, within the constraints uh, so that we maintain a safe flight profile. We've also upgraded our payload accommodations, so we can accommodate over 200 kilograms. Um, we can also work directly with the customer to customize a payload interface for a specific uh, mission specific mounting, excuse me. So one example is we've got a customer right now who has several optical units and LIDAR systems that require a pointing angle, a specific pointing angle at the landing site uh, during flight. Um, so we've worked to customize with them the location and the angle and the pointing angle um, of those instruments to ensure they're getting the test data that they need. We've also got removable access panels to the payload bay which you'll see on the next slide. Um, that really simplifies pre-flight ops. It allows us to get into the payload bay, move things around, test things before we fly. Uh, really simplifies integration. And the last up upgraded payload accommodation is that our vehicle can supply power um, in an RF downlink. So that minimizes really the functional requirements of your payload because we can provide that for you. And the last new benefit really is our advanced point-to-point -point capabilities. Um, the propulsion system is high life, high reliability, and we've got several algorithms that allow us to do things like return to launch site during an abort scenario or use a most fuel efficient optimal guidance. Um, and that provides ultimately more flexibility on where we launch and where we land, which gives our customers the ability to have a more dynamic uh, test platform. So there's several design elements that are pretty key to those uh, new capabilities. The first is sort of the modular design. So I talked about how our payload bay can be sort of adaptable for customers, um, but we can also customize trajectories and test plans um, to fly in, in whatever trajectory uh, really you need. But we've also got grid fins, so those provide stability and control during the descent phase. And we've got a high precision GNC system on board. So we'll be capable of, of sub-meter landing accuracy, and that's enabled by a tactical grade IMU and a GPS position correction algorithm. Um, we've got an increased flight time on this vehicle relative to the legacy LOX IPA by propellant systems. We're running a liquid methane liquid oxygen system. Um, so it's a higher and more efficient specific impulse compared to um, Zodiac. We've also got a deployable landing gear that you can see in this model here. Um, it's currently stowed in the aerodynamic configuration. So that allows us to essentially mitigate some of the aerodynamic drag and um, destabilizing aerodynamic effects that occur when you're flying at these increased speeds um, compared to some of our legacy vehicles where you may have seen, um, for example, I can show you Zodiac here has the landing gear, uh, gears fixed in a fixed deployed state. Um, so we'll be able to actuate those and deploy them in a landing state. Um, and the major, the major benefit of using this system is the way that we're able to customize our trajectories. So that's enabled by multiple attitude control systems. We've got RCS thrusters, grid fins and thrust gimbling that combine um, to allow us to have a high level of attitude control. But really any rocket is, you know, 90% propulsion system, right? That's, that's sort of the legs that feed the wolf here. Um, so our system can throttle much deeper um, than our legacy systems. It's equipped with a turbo pump and a gas generator that enable those high flow rates that, al that um, allow us to generate 6,000 pound force of thrust during takeoff. Uh, but we can also control that flow and, and throttle down to around 1,000 pound feet, uh, pound force, excuse me, for uh, soft vertical landings. Um, so you could sort of get a sense of how 
the different throttling capabilities add to the custom trajectories that we can make for our customers. Um, the system is also more fuel efficient based on the liquid ox, uh, liquid methane propellant, like I said, compared to the legacy systems, but it also requires significantly less maintenance um, in between flights compared to LOX RP-1 engines that are somewhat industry standard. Um, the actual thrust chamber itself is made of a NASA developed alloy. It's a high strength copper, chromium and niobium alloy and it supports really high heat applications, which again is critical for generating that 6,000 pounds of thrust. Um, and that engine chamber is additively manufactured with a Maston patent pending method. Um, so it's a semi-porous alloy and ultimately that it increases the strength to weight ratio, um, but it also reduces the number of parts and lowers our manufacturing costs, lowers complexity, um, so it's a huge benefit of our system. And that concludes the material that I had to present today on Mastin and Zogdor. I hope you all found the presentation informative and I'd love to answer some questions um, if I can. Yeah, of course. Ah, fantastic, amazing presentation. Uh, Mastin has been doing a wonderful job. Uh, this is amazing. So uh, anyone, uh, please click raise hand. Uh, Brandon, you have any question? Uh, go ahead, Brandon. Brandon, you are welcome to uh, unmute and speak out. Oh, there we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Sorry, I keep forgetting I mute my mic on my end too. Anyway, no worries. Um, <laughs> um, I was curious as to whether or not uh, the uh, uh, the the newest generation uh, uh, Riesel rocket you have here is yeah, Zogdor. Um, Zogdor. Sorry, um, is it? Uh, how can I put this? Is it? Has, um, I'm trying to think how to phrase this. I'm sorry. Um, has it been tested for longevity? Just out of curious, like how. How long do you expect any particular uh, unit to be in usage or what would be a viable time frame? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. We have not uh, completed the build of flight vehicle one yet. So we mm. haven't had the capability to do um, longevity testing at, at the system level. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for that. No, 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 that's okay. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to answer that. Um, I did have one other question I wanted to ask about. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, it, or, or and in this slide here, it mentions there's a uh, the uh, uh, there being fewer parts. Uh, fewer parts in what regard exactly? I was I was a little confused as to what you meant by that. Um, in the components that go into the uh, engine chamber. Oh, okay. So it's like a streamlining of the uh, of of the uh, of the uh, thrust propulsion. Then, yes, exactly. So the three D printing allows us, um, you know, to print the mass in a single unit, as opposed to printing out multiple components and fixing them together, um, specifically for the engine chamber. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, there's a good bit of information specifically on those capabilities um, on the website. So if you want to check that out, go to Maston.Arrow, I think. Okay, I appreciate the information and thank yep. you very much for answering my questions. No problem. I think, uh, let me see. Uh, I think we have uh, Darlene. Let's see, Darlene, where is... Uh... Yeah, I see it. <laughs> So yeah, Darlene asks, yeah. I'm in college. What does a person need to major in uh, and learn how to work in this industry? So Darlene, I'm so happy that you asked. First of all, um, I think the great thing about the aerospace industry is that there are so many disciplines of engineering that are represented. Even within you know, just the design of Zogdor here, We've got structural engineers. I'm an electrical engineer. We've got chemical engineers, um, thermal analysis. Um, so top to bottom, you know, if there's really any 
physics discipline that piques your interest, I would say just go for it and have fun. And I think generally the aerospace industry is where we're pushing the envelope just due to the nature, A, of, of the environment that we have to work in, space is harsh, um, but B, due to just the difficulty of the environment as well, it's, it's hard to access, you can't fix things. Um, so we're always pushing for more reliable, better functionality, better lifetimes. Um, but like I said, I, I think if you, you know, if there's any discipline that really piques your interest, go for it. Um, fight, it's going to be hard. Engineering is never easy, but you don't also don't have to go down the engineering track. You know, there's, we've got flight software, computer scientists, there are business ops and development people that, that are extremely critical um, in our operations. Um, so if you want to be involved in the industry, I would just say, give it your all, you know, that's all we can do. Okay, that was a lot of options there. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, if, if there's anything like in more specific that you wanna ask, I would be happy to talk offline um, and give you a little bit more background on myself and my career path. Like I said, I studied physics and then aerospace. So um, it was pretty wide open as to what discipline I wanted to focus on after that. Um, so that's always an option too, is not, not hamstringing yourself into a specialty and going sort of the multidisciplinary physics route. Thank you. Yep. Um, uh, Joe, let, let me, while we are wait to see if it, more uh, question from the audience, what is why every uh, project or the uh, vehicle yeah. has started with X? Is yes. there any reason for that? There is. Um, so I think traditionally, and I don't know if this is across the entire aerospace industry, but I think with uh, a lot of the airborne platforms, they use the letter X to signify that it's an experimental vehicle. So we I sort think. of started with that, yeah, I think initially and sort of maintained the naming convention, even though obviously after a hundred successful flights, you know, something like Zodiac is no longer an experimental vehicle, but we like the naming convention. So we stick with it. Yeah, I see just like X-15, X-57, all those mm -hmm. kind of things. Wonderful. Exactly. Yeah, I, I think this picture is uh, is really amazing. You know, Mason obviously has done a wonderful job, but I know Zodiac is more for, you know, is kind of part of the, the Artemis contract with, with, with a award from NASA. Is Zacto also related to the NASA award or is something that is your own initiative? Um, it... some, of the, some of the testing that we may have done on Zodiac for NASA, yeah, it, it may have been related to Artemis. I'm not super familiar um, with, with the entire history of the program, um, but our commercial lunar payload services contract, that's separate um, from what we're doing with Zodiac. So we're developing you know, an entirely different vehicle. You can see down here, that's um, obviously designed for the lunar environment. Yeah, I see, I see, I see, yeah. Yeah, because um, yeah, or, originally today we were kind of, uh, but they couldn't make it uh, uh, astrobotics. Uh, I don't know if people see that um, uh, it, because he put this uh, uh, lander here in the lower left and the uh, astrobotics, they had uh, a kind of uh, uh, meeting. I think the NASA administrator, uh, uh, Bill, uh, he was there and uh, he was talking about uh, later this year and uh, obviously Mason has been doing amazing jobs as, as well. I mean there's uh, amazing uh, vehicles, landers and uh, the, the, the ro uh, rocket testing and uh, you know also I remember last time we, we posted articles about the cooling system you know for the service. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, really, that's really amazing. So Zachdor may not be kind of related directly related to Artemis but was another set of your uh, uh, your program, I see. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this this is fantastic. I mean Mason obviously is doing wonderful jobs, and uh, and and this right right here in the Los Angeles area. I mean Mojave, and uh, so we definitely um, will keep uh, everybody posted. You know about your great progresses. Uh, wonderful job, Joe. This is fantastic. Thanks, Ken. Really appreciate yeah. it. I'm really honored to be able to speak here today. Just a quick shout out to everyone on the Zogdor team that's been working really hard on this um, for a long time. And 
also plug to mast and space systems. If you want to work here, we're hiring propulsion engineers, payload integrators. Um, go check out our website, submit an application, uh, and we'd love to chat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, folks, you know, Mesa is a wonderful company with great leadership, and uh, Matthew is great, uh, you know, uh, over there, and, uh, 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 you know, and, and have been very supportive, and uh, we, we, you know, will continue to support uh, Mason and the post wonderful uh, progress made by Joe, uh, Matthew, and uh, all the member teams uh, you, you, you mentioned. It's just wonderful. Uh, make a uh, new space activity more exciting and uh, a human back to space uh, and the robotic back uh, uh, to the moon as well, as soon as possible. Um, that's wonderful. I, I think, Brandon, you raise hand again. Do you want to say something again? Or just oh, uh, sorry, no, I, I realized I accidentally hit it earlier. My apologies. Okay. All right. So uh, I think that's it. If you have more questions, please uh, uh, let us know later on. Uh, I'll see if the uh, speaker has more uh, chances. So thank you so much, Joe. This is fantastic. Amazing presentation. Yeah, thank you, guys. Uh, yeah, stay in touch with AIWA. Uh, this is a wonderful organization. So everyone, so uh, today we have a wonderful experience with the new space, very exciting, uh, from Dr. Uh, Garrett talking about this uh, physics, about this uh, 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 helping, uh, you know, the study for, uh, you know, the SpaceX launch anomaly. We are trying not trying to criticize anything. We are just bringing you that uh, what's important behind the scene. Uh, the physics, the uh, engineering, and uh, how we together can help you know the uh, new space activity move uh, safer and uh, save money and uh, uh, move uh, faster and have a greater uh, job market. Uh, so then we have the uh, Leia uh, because we miss uh, Michael from Blue Origin, uh, but he will tell join us next time. Uh, Leia talk talk to us about this uh, amazing Uncoops uh, uh, program for. Uh, student and the teachers that's uh, for the future uh, definitely for the young generation and the future of uh, aerospace and uh, new space and then we have Peter talking about this exciting proposal for the uh, a change interchangeable tubio uh, for space hotel medical or space station or on the moon on Mars uh, and uh, we have the exciting VR AR uh, 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 overview and uh, uh, you know uh, presentation by Dennis it's great potential is definitely something the new space uh, is based on. And of course, Joe just told us about this a great development for Lander rockets and uh, vehicles uh, by Mason. It's an amazing company. Uh, so to, together, we really have lots of fun. And uh, I just tell you, AIWA is a wonderful organization with so many members working in different uh, industry, not just NASA, the traditional aerospace, but many people in new space, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, Actually, today we're supposed to have actually one or two more speakers uh, from different company, and you probably saw the news. They have very successful launch uh, early this month, men or uh, just uh, test test uh, vehicles, and uh, just amazing. And they're just so busy they could not make it uh, this month, but they will join us uh, uh, as it goes. So. Uh, uh, if you are, uh, you know, pay attention to AIWA, if you are not a member, think about it. If you're a member, keep uh, tracking the, the uh, information and uh, uh, engage with AIWA. And uh, uh, this will help you yourself and also help the, uh, the general community and the young generation as well. And AIWA is here and Los Angeles the Space Sector is happy to provide this event and will continue to do so. So please stay tuned. Uh, and the May 14th is the uh, AR VR event with Dennis, and uh, we have more demo. Uh, it's a live event in person. You can bring your own VR or just in person networking. It is also a young professional, early career professional, but uh, students K 12 are also welcome. Okay, thank you so much again. So, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, we have fun today. It's wonderful, great experience. So, uh, uh, enjoy the, the rest of the day and the weekend and stay in touch. Uh, let us know anything you need and whatever you, you are thinking, and we are here to uh, to assist you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Bye, Ken. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, RP. Thank you. Wonderful.